Oh 
Okay. Shall we start? Shall we start, sir? Ayan Okay, good morning Eastern Visayas and to the hundreds of academic professionals in attendance from the Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube live platforms. Welcome to the ninth webinar session of the training workshop on course modules production for flexible learning in higher educational institutions presented to us by the Content Development Committee of the Eastern Visayas Higher Educational Institutions Flexible Learning Management System Consortium. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rexor Magbutay from the College of Arts and Sciences of Northwest Summer State University. And it is an honor to be the face that welcomes all of you here today as your moderator for the webinar. Allow me, on behalf of the faculty, staff, key officials, and president of today's webinar's host institution, to so acknowledge the efforts of the partner state universities and colleges in the Eastern Visayas, their respective university presidents, our chair regional office director, Dr. George M. Colorado, and our chair commissioner, Dr. Alvin A. Darilag, in making this live webinar series a success so far since its commencement on Thursday, June 11. Thank you very much. Now, as we proceed, so the official opening of the program today, it is best that we first lay down and establish once and for all some video conferencing etiquettes we all are expected to carry out all throughout this session. First, first, of course, test device compatibility, which I am assuming everybody has already done prior to this Zoom meeting. However, in the event that your device for some reason fails to connect or reconnect to the Zoom host or server at some point of the webinar, please check the alternative broadcast feed through our peripheral platforms at Facebook Live or at YouTube Live. In Facebook, you may look for the page EVHEI's FLMSC Content Development. Again, that's EVHEI's FLMSC Content Development. And in our YouTube Live, you may look for the channel Pedro VIII or 8. H E M I S. Again, that's Chadro V I I I H E M I S. Just be sure to choose the highest video resolution feasible to your current internet setup so that you may get the clearest reception of the live webinar. Next, please do not navigate on the screen share features. That is the last thing we ever want to do as participants of this meeting. And then please be on time because entry while it is going, will not be approved. Next, to the attendees in the Zoom meeting, please do not forget to mute your audio and video. However, if your videos are active, please practice decency. And please practice decency. Next. Please rename your profile. To those who are participating in the Zoom meeting, we already know the drill. In the previous sessions, we were requested to affix our institutional affiliation before our names, and the same is still encouraged of us today. Just hover around the participants tab, look for your name, and press rename to create the necessary changes. Again, hover around the participants tab, look for your name, and press rename to create the necessary changes. And then if you are on Zoom meeting, please wear proper attire. Even at least for the, for the upper, for, for, your, for your trunks. Uh, you shout out to the Director of Quality Assurance of the University for lending me this very beautiful coat that I am using right now. Next, please avoid distractions so we can get the most out of today's resource speakers input. And then during the open forum at the later stage of this webinar, Please speak only if and when recognized. For our participants in Facebook and YouTube Live, your comments and questions will also be entertained. <clears throat> and finally, please log out only at the end of the session. Again, only at the end of the session. 
This is to ensure that everybody gets a fair share of the knowledge we will be given freely later on. And for our Facebook and YouTube live audience, here are some other internet etiquettes or netiquettes to consider. First, be kind and polite in asking questions and in expressing comments, questions, suggestions, and or feedback on the comment threads. Next, trolling is highly discouraged. And avoid capitalizing all the letters in your comments. And remember that a little review and that little backspace key could be the friends that will save us from the potentially evitable image of yelling over the screens of your cell phones and your laptops. Please double check your questions, comments, suggestions, and or feedback before posting so to develop a well-constructed and cohesively logical answers from our speakers. Remember, the first step getting the right answer is asking the right questions. If the connection of the live coverage is unstable, transfer to another available platform. Or if all else fails at this very moment because of the poor internet feed in your sites or areas, you are always welcome to revisit and access the archived videos found in the alternative channels, which will be available shortly after the conclusion of the web. And you may check EVHEI's FLMSC content development and Chedro VIII or 8 HEMIS on Facebook and YouTube, respectively. And finally, prior questions on the Facebook and YouTube pages of EVHEI's FLMSC, let us remember that what we have right here is a platform for educators, and as such, we must behave accordingly. So that's pretty much the etiquettes that we need to consider all throughout the session of this webinar. Now, to grace the opening of this session, may we request the Dean of the College of Engineering and Technology of Northwest Summer State University, Engineer Ryu M. Demakiling, to lead us the prayer. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we praise and adore you for the gift of life. Family, friends, and for entrusting us our occupation to serve our students and clientele. We praise you that you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the same God who divide the sea. The fourth man in the fairy furnace, and the one who promised us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. In this time of COVID-19 pandemic, we pray you that you will continue to shield us by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. That said virus will not come near our dwelling. Cleanse us, O Lord, for whatever field we have in our hearts and minds so that we will be deserving to receive your blessing. Ask for your forgiveness to our shortcomings, may it be intended or not. And we thank you that you hold not any grudge against us, your children. God, we thank you for making a way when COVID-19 seems to show us that there is no way for us to reach anymore our students. Father God, 
we acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing. Thus, as we will be having our webinar this morning, we pray for your blessings, peace, protection, and healing to all the sick. May all those who suffer from COVID-19 and whatever sickness that bind them be held in Jesus' name. We rebuke the spirit of the enemy. We cast out every plan of destruction. Bless us with the retentive memory and sharp intellect that we will learn and understand what the speaker will discuss to us in today's webinar. Bless the speaker with focused courage and wisdom to share what we ought to learn today in addition to our preparation for the new normal city. And as we attend to this webinar, despite our distance and individual differences, unite us, O oh God, with your love and compassion that may your glory be revealed in this endeavor. Be at the midst of us, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. Before we proceed to the introduction of today's resources speaker, let us first have a quick recap of the webinar session that has concluded yesterday. Through one of the professors in the College of Education in the Northwest Somerset University, please welcome Dr. Maria Lucille H. Doliani. Good morning, everyone. Yesterday's session was indeed enlightening with our resource person, Dr. Juan Robertino Macalde, who comprehensively discussed flexible learning for the new normal and development of self-instructional materials and learning chunks. He started this lecture by contrasting the school situation before and after the lockdown. He also defined the terms distance learning, e-learning, blended learning, and flexible learning. Then, he presented eight flexible learning approaches. He shed light on how flexible instructional materials are made by sharing Timeo's journey on Learn Tech, Excel's action research project. He explained how they came up with modules for their programs for school heads and Guru 21. According to Dr. Macalde, Educators today are faced with a challenge on how to transition to the new normal in education and learning, how to shift from public space to personal space, how to shift from one size fits all learning to individualized and differentiated learning, how to shift the responsibility of teaching and learning process, and how to shift from final exams to formative assessment. With this challenge comes flexible learning as the answer, and technology as an aid. He presented comparative information on categories on the level of technology, available devices, internet connectivity, level of digital literacy, and approaches. According to him, for high-level technology, online or blended learning approach can be used. For medium-level technology, micro and macro approach can be utilized and for low-level technology, self-instructional module with four A's approach is suitable. He emphasized that in making flexible learning materials, we need to consider the characteristics of our learners, the Generation Z and the Generation Alpha, as well as their learning styles. In developing modules, he cautioned us to watch out for intellectual property rights 
copyright, creative commons, and plagiarism. And in using technology, he also told us to watch out for claimers, trolls, and lurkers. He discussed the step-by-step -step preparation of the self-instructional material, planning and analysis, designing and development, and implementation and management. He emphasized to build active learning by identifying effective learning outcomes, by being interactive, and by choosing appropriate learning activities. He lectured on the four A's of learning, activity, analysis, abstraction, and application. He also gave 15 tips on writing style and four tips on visual design. In the afternoon session, the participants from different SUCs presented their sample learning chunks. Every presentation was followed by critiquing. And the day ended with a warm thank you to Dr. Juan Robertino Macalde, who shared those big chunks of knowledge. Thank you once again. Good morning. Thank you very much, Ma'am Lucille, for the very comprehensive review of Dr. Macalde's discussion yesterday. So from the learning chunks, today we will be taking on another topic in the live webinar series, this time focusing on the increasingly demanding task of delivering student-centered assessment to higher education students. Since its conception in the formal educational context of the past century, initiating a context where students lead in designing their own learning experiences has always been an influential yet daunting encounter to education practitioners and researchers alike. More so, to a large extent, while this approach of learning is thriving and is continually being practiced in the teaching learning setup of this generation, a huge chunk of the student-centered practice is shaken, challenged by the growing pandemic affecting even the remotest communities out there. And then we are left with the ultimate question. In these times, how do we make our students still the captains of their ships and us, the deck officers who ensure their safe navigation and passages in the sea of knowledge? All these, the questions, the metaphors, and everything in between will be made clear in a short while as we welcome our key person for today through the introduction the president of the Northwest Summer State University, Dr. Benjamin L. Picayo. Hello, good morning, everyone. To our uh, beloved commissioner, Commissioner Aldrin Darilag, the brainchild of this uh, consortium, the father of Ched of Regionet, Regional Office Number at uh, Director George Colorado and his staff. Fellow President of State Universities and Colleges in the region. Official of SOX. Participants from different universities. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our resource person of today's FLS webinar. She is a woman who always strives for success. She's a woman of passion. Today, as everyone partakes in this webinar session entitled Designing Student-Centered Assessment and Flexible Learning, we will be listening to a woman with incomparable passion and unparalleled standard of excellence. As uh, a university professor in the Philippine Normal University, where her career as an educator, curriculum planner, evaluator, and researcher has blossomed. In fact, she is known as a woman who remains undeniably firm with her passion in her field. Our research person has a very profound inclination to teaching and learning. As she finished her undergraduate degree in elementary education with flying colors in Piño. Her doctorate degree in research and evaluation in the University 
of the Philippines. And on top of that is her postdoctoral fellowship for leadership and research, which she obtained from the University of New England, Australia. After she was lead various national research project, being the inaugural director of the Philippine National Research Center for Teacher Quality. Our research person is also nationally and internationally commended personality for having to publish books, chapters, and articles in the areas of educational assessment, teacher education, and mathematics education. She has been a valiant community catalyst, serving hand in hand with many big institutions like the Commission on Higher Education, Department of Education, World Bank, Australian government, smart communications, and many more in formulating curricular and system reforms. She has also held various administrative positions in PNU in academic research and international research program. The most recent was her being the dean of the College of Flexible Learning and EP in you for three fruitful years. Presently, our resource person is the president of the Philippine Educational Measurement and Evaluation Association, or the PIMIA. Proud and determined, she is the first to conduct series of webinars on digital citizenship for PNU system faculty and staff in the first month of the COVID-19 in the country, which she, which is actually her latest innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming our highly esteemed resource person for today, Dr. Marilyn Obinia Balagtas from Philippine Normal University. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin Picayo. That was so generous of you. I was so overwhelmed by your introduction, sir, and I hope I could meet your expectations. Thank you so much. To, to our commissioner, um, Dr. Aldrin Darilag, and all other officials from CHED Region 8 who are facilitating this webinar, and to Dr. Jude Duarte, who communicated with me to be part of this webinar. Thank you, sir, for your trust in me. To all other officials, faculty, and my colleagues in education who are tuned in in this webinar uh, via Zoom, um, Facebook, and YouTube, a pleasant morning to one and all. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be part of your program. And being um, a part of the National Center for Teacher Education, that's PNU, we really welcome invitations like this as uh, we're supposed to contribute to preparing teachers, educators, uh, particularly teacher education institutions for the demands of um, the opening of classes considering the current situation that we are into. So thank you so much for my uh, involvement in this webinar. I just want to make sure that everyone has a very good viewing and listening facility. So may I request everyone to please mute, mute first, mute your microphone, but turn on your camera. Let me check if you uh, please can hear me. All right, I want to see your camera on. Uh, all right, can let us try if uh, we could see everyone with the camera on, but please turn off your microphone. Okay, this is what I want you to do just to check that you are there. Since we are here to talk about assessment, I want to ensure that everyone is ready for this webinar. So may I request you to turn on your camera mute your microphone just allow me to use the microphone but i hope everyone turns on his or her camera 
Now, this is an assessment of your viewing and listening facility. So some did not turn on their camera. I don't know, maybe there is a problem. But this is a test of your preparedness to listen and um, interact with me in this three hour or less. Yeah, it's already past 9.30, so less than three hours um, webinar where we will be talking about assessment. Okay, I could see uh, a few of you whose camera is on, but the rest, uh, majority did not turn it on. This is my test. Can you see my hands? Could you please imitate what I'm doing? Okay, just to check that you are really seeing me. I want to assess your ability to listen and follow. But probably listen first, just listen, because I want to make sure that your listening facility, um, your, your gadget, your connectivity is good. Okay? That, that is important to me. So just to check when I say pick, cup your head. Come on, cup your head. That you have to do when I say pick, all right? When I say pack, cup your shoulders. Come on, do it. Cup your shoulders. And when I say boom, cup your chest. Okay, so that means you could hear me. Let me ask you to do it this time without me acting or showing the actions. All right, Pete. What will you do? Pack. Shoulders. Boom. Chest. Very good. One more time, Pete. Pack. Boom, pit, pack, boom, pit, pack, boom. Oh, mali mali yung ginagawa niyo because you are looking at me. So again, may I articulate my objective? I want you to show me your ability to listen to my verbal instructions. So it's going to be what I say that you have to follow and not what I do. Okay, remember in assessment to test your ability. Sometimes we have to add distractors. So I'm adding distractor here just to make sure that you really understood my instructions. So it's your listening ability that I am assessing here and not your ability to follow my actions. For you to take this seriously, let me add some criteria in assessing your ability. Okay. Because we're talking of assessment and you should be, well, you should understand that when we assess, uh, most often we set our criteria. So I have two criteria in mind. The first criterion is the correctness of your actions. So when I say pick, what will you cap again? Okay. Pick, so pack, boom. Okay. And you have to use your two hands. It cannot just be one hand. Okay, you have to use your two hands. So let's do it quickly. Ready, go. Pit, pack, boom. Pit, pack, boom. All right. Now I will add another criterion and that is speed. You have to do it quickly in just one second. So as soon as you hear my instructions, then do it immediately. So that should just be one second. The time interval between my command and your response should just be a second. Okay? Now, in assessment, we are not only thinking of criteria, but we have also to think of the levels of performance. And I'm thinking of a four-point scale to test your ability to listen and follow instructions. Using the two criteria that I set, I will formulate four levels of performance. The highest is excellent, and that is when you did not make any mistake in action or in speed in all my commands so you were perfect flawless but if you made a mistake either in your action or you were slow no in moving that is considered incorrect so one mistake that will lead you to level three out of four levels and that will just be interpreted as very good okay if you made two mistakes then that is just good and if you made three, three or more mistakes, then that would be one, four. All right? So did you hear clearly, clearly my instructions? Four levels. How many criteria? Two. But I made use of these two criteria in formulating four performance levels. All right. Tell me, what do you want for yourself? What is your goal? 
among the four levels of performance, four being the highest, what do you want to become? Do you want to become excellent or do you want to become poor? Show me your goal using your fingers. Come on. Ready? Show me your, your goal. I could see four, four, four. Let me check the other side. All right. I could see all. Mom, Sherry. Okay. The others who did not. I could see all showing me four. Very good. I want you to know that that is also my aim for you. That is not just what you want for yourself. But being the facilitator of this webinar, I also want all my participants to be aiming for the same level of proficiency that I want all of you to demonstrate your excellent ability to follow verbal instructions. So let us uh, consider that in mind. Let us um, put that in mind that we all want to become four. All right, let's test now your ability, your excellent ability to follow verbal instructions. Ready? Pick. Come on, show me now excellence in your performance. Pick, pack, pick, pack, boom. Ayan, sir, mali ka, sir. Ah, sino ba tong si Blue? Joshua, sir. Ang boom, dito, sir. Ah, you were imitating me, okay? Again, trial lang muna. I don't want you to fail, so let's have another practice. Come on, pick, pack. Boom. Pick. Boom. Ma ay, very good. O, mar marunong na, marunong na. Hindi na sila ma-deceive. Alright, this time I will not uh, say any, I will not show the action. I will just give my command. Let me see if this is better for you. Pick. Come on, ready, ready, get set, go. Pick. Pack. Pick. Pack. O, sino nagkamali na? Be honest. Evaluate your own performance. Sino nagkamali na? Show me your hand if you made a mistake. How many missed one? Oh, no one admits? O, sige, the excellent pa rin. Okay, ready? Let's have another round. Pick. Pack. Pack. Ah, may nagkamali na, may na bluff na. <laughs> so who made a mistake? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Come on. So you are no longer excellent. You are just very good. Ha, ah, that's frustrating. Oh, sige, let's forget about that. This time, let's take it seriously. So that's just a, a practice. That's just a rehearsal. Now it's going to be our final assessment. In the interest of time, let's do it seriously. Ready? Pick. Pack. Pick, pack, 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 boom, boom, boom. Ayan, sino nagkamali? Taas nga kamay? Sino nagkamali? Wala. O, sige pa nga, isa pa nga. Pick. Ayan, nag strategize na yung iba sa inyo. May pumipikit na ngayon. Hindi ko sinasabi, but that is a good strategy. So you won't be deceived by my actions. Ready? Seriously? Pick. Pack. 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 Boom. 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 Wow, ang galing. So that's it. Congratulations. How many got four? Taas nga ang self-evaluation nyo. Show me your self-evaluation. Is it four, three, two, one? Show me. All right, let me just check the other side. Okay, everybody shows four. Congratulations. That's how I uh, evaluate you too, um, having seen your performance. So I'm glad you all have an excellent uh, listening ability and facility to listen and uh, view my presentation. So we can now turn off the microphone. i sorry, not the microphone, but the camera. So... Uh, if you like, but don't turn on your uh, microphone. Uh, so I can show you now my slides. As I have been tasked to talk about uh, designing student-centered assessment in a flexible learning environment. Okay. So let me show you my slides. Uh, may I request our moderator, Rexor? 
to please remind me if uh, something is wrong with my uh, presentation, if you could not view it. Uh, Sir Rexor. Okay, I'm showing my screen. I hope everyone could see it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, Paul. Good. We are currently seeing the, the slides. Okay, so I'm now showing you my slides. Thank you so much for all your participation. And again, congratulations for having shown us uh, an excellent uh, ability to listen and follow uh, instructions. I would like uh, everyone to know that my session is uh, something that I hope could contribute to your current efforts of preparing course uh, module, right? Um, you are developing materials for instruction. And uh, I heard you have already started doing the work. Uh, well, that's understandable since today is your fourth, is it fourth day of your webinar, fourth or fifth? Uh, webinar okay in a uh, webinar in in the series of uh, webinars i want you to know that um in uh, planning this session i have to think of what i expect if i were you if uh, you were part of the audience no and i thought these topics would be of help to you in understanding how to design a student-centered assessment considering the different modalities in the delivery of instruction so that's why we call them uh, flexible as we could adopt uh, or use any modality that is um, applicable uh, considering the resources not only of the teachers but the students as well and i thought to cover three uh, big topics so this uh, well of course uh, i heard several speakers have already gave uh, they already gave definitions of the important terms that uh, were covered in this webinar and probably i could share my own operational definitions too not necessarily those that i borrowed from books but i could cite one as well just to marry uh, ideas that i believe in as practitioner for more than 30 years and that which i also uh, came across in literature and uh, of course being a person into assessment that i i cannot just move on to explaining the signing of assessment without making you uh, uh, be refreshed with some purposes and principles that could guide our practice in assessing learning so to begin um well this is still part of assessment. Earlier on, I tested your readiness to listen, no? uh, given your facility. This time, I want to know your prior knowledge of the topic that has been identified to be the focus of this morning's session. And I gave the link to uh, Sir Neil a while ago so that you could access the form. If you could please check the chat box. I uh, messaged you this morning before we started um, with this link. But of course, you can copy this too. For those of you who have mobile phone or iPad where you could uh, see the QR enabled in your uh, phone, then you can also take a picture of this QR code so this uh, form could be accessible to you. So there are three ways to access my form. One is the link that I shared in the chat box of the Zoom, and I hope uh, Sir Neil also shares that to the um, ones who are hooked to Facebook and I, I understand YouTube, if that's possible. And then for those who are tuned in uh, as part of this session, and you can um, encode this link, try, or take a photo of the QR code. Okay, I'm giving you 10 minutes or less. Um, the fewer, the lesser the time you need in doing it, the better. I actually gave that earlier so that uh, you could uh, start no, even without my instructions. I, I hope you've started even without hearing my instructions. So try this first. I want to know where you are now so far.
Okay. I hope you are ready. Okay, let's move on. Let's check if you were able to access the form. So this is a test of your prior knowledge. Sorry. So there were only five respondents. So what happened? I want to see the response of the others. It's increasing now. I'm happy to know that you are open to learning new things today. That's the mode, that's the most popular response. From 23 respondents so far. So there are four who are curious to know if there's something new they will learn. It's a challenge to me. So the highest is still number one here. I'm ready to learn new things. Uh, Violet is also coming as the second. I think the topic is something I need. So let's uh, just allow that uh, to be open for probably the first part of the morning. 45 are now responding. So there are three popular responses. I already heard the resource person. One heard me already talk. Yes, because I think I have been to three universities in this consortium. Uh, Samar State University with uh, Dr. Marlene Maikatukaya as the president. Um, Ma'am Cardoso of Samar State University. And prior to that, maybe more than a decade ago, <laughs> when I've been to PIP for, I think, three days or more. And of course, our sister uh, university, Late and Normal University sister because uh, Late and Normal is part of the National Network of Normal Schools. And we do have a lot of uh, projects together in this network. And recently, uh, the project that I directed with Late and Normal as uh, a part is the training for the newly hired teachers of the Department of Science and Technology scholars who are now in the DepEd system. So that's the RA10612. So probably uh, those who are tuned in, uh, particularly in the webinar, in this um, platform, one rather has heard me talk already. One prefers a pink. Let's check what the pink one is. What does it say? Let's not show. Ah, please specify in the next. Ah, okay. So somebody preferred putting in her response in the next item. Let's see the details. Uh -huh. She wants new strategies, strategic ways in assessing students' learning. All right. 
in this time of pandemic. Yes, that's our target. Okay. I'm ready. All right, good to know. Let's look. What do you teach in the tertiary level? So most of you are ah, non-eduk. All right. So you are probably in a comprehensive college or university. Unlike the Philippine normal university, of course, that's the only university I think in the, uni in the Philippines that focuses only to teacher ed. Uh, late and normal is already comprehensive too, I think. Have you experienced teaching online? Majority said no. So that's understandable. So that's the reason probably why you are here tuned in in this webinar. How ready are you in teaching in this coming opening of classes in HEIs? Uh, I still need to help preparing myself. So that's the reason why you are here in the webinar. Uh, I am very much ready to teach. Very good. 18 said that. Probably these are the experienced uh, online facilitators because uh, more than 20%, uh, huh, 44 44 um, said yes to have experience teaching online. And I hope they experience assessing online as well because that's assessment is a component of instruction. So it says here, who sets the learning objective? So this is now the start of the question uh, of knowing your knowledge of what we mean by being student-centered in the way we assess students, particularly now that the modality is flexible, which is open to um, uh, a modality that the students prefer the base, uh, considering their pace and place and resources. Well, uh, many would say still the teacher has to decide on what the learning objectives should be. So it's still the teacher and followed by number three, which says it depends on the level of uh, needs problem. So that's the third one, the green one, uh, L. Uh, it depends on the level of maturity of the learners. So the popular, we can see the trend that the popular is still giving the responsibility to the teacher, the um, responsibility rather to decide on what the learning objectives should be for their assessment, which should be linked to the objectives of their instruction. And for the seventh question, who sets the learning strategy? Again, the most popular response is the teacher decides that. No? It's the teacher who decides on what the appropriate learning strategy is uh, for assessment, the learning strategy for uh, assessment. And next, uh, who designs the assessment for learning in a student's, this is the, it's the who sets kanina, ito naman, who designs the assessment for learning in a student-centered assessment in a flexible learning environment, uh, the popular answer is still the teacher being an authority. And the ninth one, which of the following processes in designing an online assessment is are not ideal? And uh, you put here step one as not so ideal, followed by number 56. Okay, let's uh, check the question later on. Uh, step two. But the answers here are actually these ones that were checked. Number 10, uh, all are possible, but the frequency, this is a multiple response type of question. And so you can take all if you want, uh, but again, the, the frequency differs. So let's check on the question where, wow, we have 186 respondents now. So these were the questions for those who were not able to access the form. Let me show it to you so you have an idea of what the others have accomplished. And uh, as long as you are tuned in here, I hope you could uh, imagine what I wanted uh, everyone to tell me first so I understand where you're coming from. So majority said I'm ready to learn. I, I just want to check the question uh, which says, so here, you're supposed to give your own answer. I did not close the item by just fixing the response to what I thought one could uh, provide. I made it open to accommodate other possible thoughts that uh, the participants might want to share instead of just picking a response from a set that has already been designed 
or anticipated by the assessor. So this is one way of making your assessment open, making it more student-centered to accommodate preferred responses of your assessees or your students. So you provide a space for that. So that is to um, give respect to their own preferred uh, response and not to be reliant on you all the time. What do you teach in the tertiary? I hope I captured all possibilities here. Have you experienced? This is a binary type of question, so we only expect two answers there. How ready are you in teaching? Well, uh, well, this, these are the choices, and I think the majority said, I still need help preparing myself on online teaching, if ever this is the modality to use in the first part of the term. And I think we have to be ready with that. And for the questions, who sets the learning objectives? Uh, so it is uh, the most popular in your um, in the frequency that we saw a while ago is the teacher. For number seven, uh, who sets the learning strategy? A while ago, the learning objective. Okay, so that's the difference. This time, uh, it is, uh, well, I think the majority still said uh, the teacher as the authority of instruction. And for the eight, who designs the assessment still? The teacher was chosen as the popular um, response. And for the questions, which of the following processes in designing an online assessment is or are not ideal? Um, well, it should be A and B. It says you set the objectives for assessment to be different from instruction. That's wrong. It should be the same as the instruction. And then the last one, four, provide the key to corrections when it is time for checking. No, while you are designing your test, you should already be ready with your response. Don't let the students answer your test without you preparing the key so that you are um, assured that all questions have an answer. And that is uh, what we thought they should uh, respond, how they should respond to your test. And for the last weeks of the following learning outcomes expected of a pre-service teacher, because I'm from a teacher education institution, could be assessed. And I, I believe these are all four, these four are possible. For example, if it's going to be teaching online that you want to uh, ask your students to demonstrate as you are training them to become teachers and you have to observe them as the, how they conduct their classes online. So that's possible. So we have 207 respondents in all, and that's the image. I'm happy you are open to learning new things and I hope I could meet your expectations. So that's it for, your pri for um, knowing who you are. So I understand that uh, majority chose a response that I thought uh, signals the need to explain this topic, uh, which is how to make our assessment student-centered. So it's not just doing our job as assessor, but making our assessment not so reliant on teachers, but to empower our students as well. You know? So they have a voice in the assessment process. Now, for those of you who uh, failed to access the form, although there were 200 plus who answered it, um, if I had to prepare a, uh, a test, no, a test of your prior knowledge in paper, I can actually redesign it to make it more practical, which I could not do in the form that I did. This format is not possible in the form that I did. But I, what, I was able to do it in paper and I want to show uh, the modification that the format has been modified but the intention is there, still there. So that's what we have to be mindful of. Um, there are adjustments that we have to make when our assessment is in paper and that when it has to be converted into a, an electronic form. But we have to keep in mind the intention. It should not uh, change. So what, uh, what do I mean here by changing the format? To make it more practical, uh, for, for the latter part of the um, test, no, the, the ones that uh, ask you your prior knowledge of what we mean by being student-centered in our assessment. The format there is multiple choice. This is also a sort of multiple choice, but I'm using a scale here. This is like a Likert scale, a semantic differential scale rather, where you see two contrasting words, uh, usually in Likert scale, uh, these are 
uh, adjectives to um, uh, they are antonyms, but here I'm using the extreme uh, individuals teach uh, in a classroom in, in the way we deliver instruction, the teacher-centered and that of a learner-centered. So this is a reformatting of the format that I use in the online testing. And that is possible when we prepare for the assessment that we have to implement considering the resources that our students have access to, not only the ones, the, the resources that we have access to as teachers. So this is just um, a way of um, reminding us what we mean by being student-centered, okay? And uh, look at this. Um, if you chose an, a response close to one, which is the most popular based on our uh, anal analytics, that would tell us that you really see yourself most credible to decide on how the learning should be delivered, how the, the students should learn, how uh, instruction should be delivered. And you see probably your students as very reliant on you that they cannot decide for themselves. And the teacher is the only authority to uh, make them understand how they become successful in their life, no? how, how uh, they could be able to uh, do things on their own. So that's your, your tendency of... Um, of uh, seeing yourself, that you are an authority, and so you have the, the final say to what you should put there in your instruction, what objectives to focus on in your ins instruction. And uh, that's understandable because that is your position. That is the role that you are expected to play in the classroom. However, there are learners who probably could decide for themselves already. No? They, they need some sort of guidance from us, but not to be too reliant on their teacher all throughout their learning at, uh, time. At a certain point, we have to see them being able to manage their own learning. So they have to be trained to be uh, self-regulated as well. So if you chose let uh, number seven, you see your, your students very independent, that they are very self-reliant, that they are mature enough to decide on how to acquire the needed knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that uh, will enable them to enjoy a happy, a healthy, and productive life. Now, of course, when you are at the right most, that means you are very learner-centered. You know, the approach to teaching is very learner-centered. And if you lean uh, close to one, then that means your students are uh, viewed as so reliant on you. However, to me, in flexible learning, we cannot right away uh, tell you know, if we have to be teacher-centered or learner-centered. We have to know first where the students are, what they are capable of doing, what resources they have to be able to plan our instruction. Of course, we have a reference um, when we deliver our curri curriculum reference to what the objectives should be or what the desired learning outcomes could be. But this reference, this curriculum um, document where all the desired learning outcomes are reflected could be shared with the students too so that they co-own the objectives that you set are essential for them to attain. So it becomes a shared goal, not only the one dictated upon by the teacher, although it is true that the teacher is an authority you know, um, to instruction, to assessment, but let us engage our students to decision-making so that even if we were the first to present the objectives, but the fact that we present this to them and ask them uh, to evaluate whether these uh, objectives reflect what they wanted to attain as well, then in the end, it becomes a shared uh, learning objectives and a shared learning strategy and assessment as well. So if we are, uh, we chose number four that, where it says it depends on where the students are. So you that would mean you have to assess them first. Just like what I did, you begin by knowing if the students are ready, if they have the capability to accessing the, the device or the platform that you are using for instruction, which could also be your platform for assessment. 
So, um, and but if you chose number four, the demand is high because that means you have to be ready with the possibility of delivering differentiated instruction differentiated instruction as some could probably need so much help from you and others could be left on their own so the differentiation is um expected in in a flexible uh, learning delivery i will not discuss all the rest of the items i am just showing here the first uh, three items called from the same tool because what I'm highlighting here is the idea already of what I mean by being flexible and being student-centered in the way we assess instruction, which usually is linked to how we also assess uh, learners. Now, let me move on to the first topic. Uh, considering the um, clamor of the audience, uh, well, based on the survey, it says there you, you expect something new from me. You are looking forward to learning new things that could uh, help you design your, your plans for this coming school year. I thought uh, it's good to, um, well, make you understand again, especially those of you who have probably not have uh, obtained uh, a program in teacher ed because I understand most of you are from non-education, delivering non-education uh, programs, usually in tertiary level, we, we are not required to take uh, the licensure exam. So for the sake of those who probably did not uh, earn units in professional education, at least in the teacher education programs, I hope this could be of help to you. So this is the, the idea of knowing who you are. But of course, being the planner, uh, of this instruction, you have to anticipate all possibilities. And I hope I could meet your expectations. So I want to make clear here what I mean by assessment. Okay, So to me, when we talk of assessment, this is not evaluation. This is needed when you evaluate. This is a process that we do first prior to judging uh, the performance of our students. So it is a process of gathering both quantitative and qualitative uh, information or indicators or evidences of students' learning, okay? And I highlighted quantitative here because this is usually what we do, especially in our case where we deal with a lot of information coming from one student or uh, coming from, um, Many students, not only from a class, but different classes. So to make our assessment more practical, that sometimes we prefer dealing with quantitative data. And so what we do with the data that we gather, although uh, initially some could be qualitative, we convert them to quantitative for easy organization and interpretation of data. For example, in essay, we gather something qualitative, but we quantify that after by giving points that could indicate the degree of quality of response given to the essay. So from qualitative, you converted it into quantitative, but you have to go back to its meaning again after because uh, numbers are meaningless unless you put value to them. So that's how valuable measurement is in the process of assessing learning. And we have to go through this process, especially if we have to decide whether we can promote a person or certify a success of one in learning a course or um, recommend for retention or retake of the subject. So we really have to be very uh, confident of the data that we have gathered uh, before we make uh, decision, especially that our decision could make or break the future of our learners. So what does it mean to be flexible? I think this has been covered in earlier uh, webinars because I heard definitions were of terms uh, have been given to, but uh, just, just uh, probably to share this view that I got from Churville in 2008 saying that flexible learning gives the learners an increased choice. Nako, napakahirap imit ito. Convenience and personalization to suit their needs. So it is needs-based. 
So it depends on their needs. So when we talk of flexibility, it's the voice of the learners that we have to listen to, that we have to consider in the design, of not only of our assessment, but also our instruction. And that would be very challenging to us teachers. Let me share to my own definition of what I mean by being student-centered here. It is an assessment that captures what the students know what they can do and value on a set of essential and quality learning considering the learner's needs, capabilities, and limitations. And when I say flexible learning environment, so this refers to the materials and non-material resources accessible for one to learn at his or her own pace, place, and preference. Okay? So uh, visually, this is how I imagine flexible learning environment is. So imagine this whole learning environment. This could be in school or at home or combination and other um, resources that students could access in order to learn. So um, that learning environment could develop or could have learners who are at different level of independence, okay? So, or reliance on teachers or on themselves. So, for those people who are used to learning with the teacher uh, or through the teacher, we could consider them to be at the left most part, teacher reliant. And those who are okay with just knowing what the course requirements are or what the syllabus is, what are expected of them, and then they could be left on their own, uh, managing their own learning um, to prove that uh, they were able to attain the, the targets that have been set, then these are the self-regulated learners. And I think knowing that we are teaching in the tertiary, tertiary level, at least in that level, that we expect learners to be at this level as well. And of course, the parents could be there throughout the process. Uh, um, and I think even when they are old enough you know, to be on their own, parents are still there monitoring their children. Now, in a learning environment where learners are considered to be still teacher-reliant, of course, teacher could be the resource. But teachers probably would need some help from other materials, especially if they see their imperfections. So there are things that they cannot provide in full where they would be needing some help coming from what we call as instructional uh, materials, okay? And that's where we could probably use the resources in our environment. This could be the realias or print materials to include modules, workbook, work text, textbook, others, or toolkit. I heard there's toolkit. So these uh, print materials could be of help too, to reinforce instruction provided by the teacher. And of course, we have other uh, ways of um, assisting students learning through videos or um, other materials that they could access in the internet. Okay, so that's how... Uh, that th those are my imaginations of the possible ways to learn in the classroom if it's done face to face. That could happen too if they are home base or online or distance no? or in a remote no? uh, place, and that's po a possibility. A possibility too, but then without the presence of the. Um, teacher face-to-face, -face, no? uh, presence of the teacher. So the, the materials that teachers have to ready here are those that students could learn on their own. Some, if they are offline, could just be couriered, uh, couriered to them. And those who are online, they could be delivered um, via internet or in the air. So it could be television or radio, although these uh, ways of learning would invite only for one-way communication, but there could be no um, interaction uh, expected. But if it's by phone, that's possible. And then it could also be online, uh, synchronous and asynchronous. I think um, you have heard this a lot from all presenters. But I, I highlighted here uh, what I prefer if I were to assess um, learners uh, with my control, you know, with, with comparable comparable uh, conditions, assessment conditions. I would go for, well, if we talk of learning, I think this is the most uh, student-centered uh, in its way of designing uh, instruction, the modules. 
And uh, I go for uh, online um, combination of asynchronous and synchronous and better if they are put in the LMS. To me, I still prefer uh, a learning environment. If I were the, because I have been the dean of the College of Flexible Learning, I would still prefer that all classrooms, virtual classrooms are set up in a common LMS, not in different platforms. We could resort to other platforms if our LMS fails in accommodating our classes. But for easy monitoring of your students and your teachers, it would be easy to visit your classroom anytime, even if you are at home or anywhere. You could visit as an administrator, you could enter the classrooms of your teachers and see how they run their classes. If you are observing no, and, and you are there, not necessarily to evaluate them, but to know who needs help uh, from you as their um, head or the dean, then it would be good if uh, they are all set up in more or less controlled platform. And that is the advantage of having a learning management system. Okay, so let me move on to the purposes and principles in designing student-centered assessment. So I would like to begin as to knowing, uh, making you understand that the very first thing that we have to know as assessors is what to assess. So there could be three uh, to easily remember this. They could be remembered as the ABCs, the affect or the disposition uh, aiming to develop your and assess your affect. This refers to attitudes and values, the behavior no, that can be shown, demonstrated, um, and informed uh, as a result of instruction and their cognition. But another way of looking at it, making it more detailed is by remembering the, the five learning targets uh, usually set by uh, education uh, specialists. No? The uh, Wiggins, um, Stiggins, Macmillan set these five learning targets and they call it knowledge, reasoning, skills, product, and affect or disposition. So of course, when we talk of knowledge, this would refer to, uh, of course, the concepts, the principles, the theories that students have to know uh, as an evidence of their knowledge of the discipline. Then we have reasoning, which would require explaining or uh, justifying or processing the information that they've acquired. And then we have um, skills that can be shown without any product or skills that could be shown with a product. So that's the product part. And of course, what I said a while ago, the affect part or the disposition, which would refer to students' attitudes, preferences, interests, and the like. Uh, why do we assess? So there are usually three. So this is... Um, well, the usual thing we do is assessment of learning. That's the graded assessment. But assessment happens all throughout instruction. The assessment that could happen, like what I did a while ago, I started assessing your preparedness, your connectivity. That is assessment for learning. So it is something that could tell us if you are coping, if you are progressing in your learning, it is one way of monitoring if you are getting to your desired goal. And this is supposed to be non-graded. This, this assessment for learning is also a time for us to diagnose if students have learning difficulties or if they have uh, problems in understanding your instruction. And the assessment as learning here is the part where you treat your students as co-assessors of their learning. So you don't see yourself as the only authority. You have to help students become authority of their own assessment. So empowering them to understand how to assess themselves so that they don't have to wait for your assessment results all the time you know they could say if they have been good or not just like what I did you no know, when I started I asked you what your target is from a four point scale four being the highest and one being the lowest you evaluated yourself you did not just wait for my evaluation to you you can do that by yourself and that is because you were assisted. So whatever is my yardstick in judging you should also be your, your, your yardstick in judging yourself so that we could compare and see 
if you are as credible as the teacher in assessing yourself. So that's what we do in assessment as learning. And especially that we talk of student-centered assessment, we have to practice this. Now, if you notice, I said a while ago, the most popular uh, purpose of assessment is assessment of learning because we end up grading our students and we are conscious of that. And our students are also conscious of that because they don't want to get low grades from us. If you look at the diagram, it goes back to this. What does that tell us? There are times when the intention is assessment of learning. It's a graded assessment. But if you see majority of your students did not meet your criterion, and when I say meet your criterion, let's say you are targeting that at least 75% of your students should have demonstrated proficiency. But after their task, you know, performance of the task, majority did not make it. Majority ended just approaching proficiency. Will you grade them on the results of assessment? It would be unfair to them if they are graded when the results clearly convey that you were not effective in your instruction because you were not able to facilitate the attainment of their target. So we end up converting our assessment of learning into simply just an assessment for learning if we have not reached our goal or we have not helped our students reach the goal that they have set in learning. So again, for example, I gave you a post test and it has, let's say, 100 items. And I set my criteria and I have to be clear as to what my uh, expectation is. And that should be communicated to the learners. And so that should be done by you too. Like a while ago, I asked you, what is your goal? How, in the four point scale, what do you want? You want four. And I said, that is also what I want from you. So we have the same goal. I heard you saying that, you heard me saying that too. But if in the end you did not reach your goal or some of you, did not uh, reach the goal, konti lang, mas madami yung nakaabot sa four, then that is indicative of my effectiveness as a teacher. But if it is the reverse, then that is embarrassing. I cannot, I cannot take that as, uh, as a result of instruction and then make you suffer from my ineffectiveness by grading you. That's so unfair on your part. And, and so, um, and, um, well, I would be unfair to you and that's, that will not make me uh, feel happy definitely if I know how assessment uh, should be done. So, um, again, make a, I want this to be clear because though I put here assessment of learning and usually summative is considered graded, please check first the results. So that's the reason why using online assessment with uh, automatic data analytics is so powerful as we could easily see if students were successful in meeting the criterion that you have set for assessment. So set your criterion. Let's say I, when I say criterion, what is considered a success to you? What is your passing grade in a test of 100, for example? Is that 75% correct? If that is your criterion, then how many of your students should have reached that level? It's not just enough that you set your criterion, but tell also set as well to of the one of the 50 students you have in your class, how many should have reached that level? Now, if only a few, I said a while ago, if only a few did not make it, then we could attribute that failure not only to the teacher, but also to the students. If they did not meet, uh, let's say one or two did not meet the target, while well, majority or almost all met the target, then the blame should not be just on you uh, as a teacher. The students have a part two in their failure. So um, it is a shared responsibility. But the fact that majority made it would make you say, well, at least I have been a student-centered. I have been very sensitive to what my students actually need from me or expect from me as a teacher as I led them to attaining the target that we, not only what the teacher has said, but we set uh, as our gates of success uh, of instruction and of their learning. All right, let me continue. So what about the principles? Well, the usual, and this is true to all, whatever modality is, there should be constructive alignment. And what do we mean by that? Of course, your instruction should be aligned to what you believe in as an essential in a curriculum. These are the desired learning outcomes. Your assessment should also be aligned to your instruction. And if you notice here, there is an arrow pointing to curriculum. What does that mean? 
you can actually design your assessment right after knowing what your curriculum is. In understanding by design by Gay Maktai and Grant Wiggins, that's their advice. Make sure that your assessment is already prepared after setting what your curriculum should be so that you know how you will assess your students after. And you will uh, design your instruction to be... Uh, to be matched with what you expect in your assessment. But then if you are student-centered, you will not only think of that route. You have to uh, prove as well that your assessment is aligned to instruction. So what I can do if I want to be more student-centered after the curriculum has been set, after knowing what the essentials are, DepEd has released its uh, most essential learning competencies. We could also have our most essential learning outcomes or MELO, I call it MELO. In teacher ed, the MELOs could be the PPST, the Philippine Professional Standards for Teachers. But for other programs, maybe you have your set of um, standards as well, which could be your reference to identifying what the most essential ones are in the set of uh, desired learning outcomes that have been set prior to COVID-19. So again, uh, there are two ways to do assessment. After the curriculum has been designed, like uh, you are already preparing your instruction, your instructional materials, you could uh, prepare as well your assessment tools. But once instruction has started, you have to revisit your assessment because you have to make sure that the way uh, assessment is designed meets also the way the students were instructed. So dapat pareho yon. So that's what we mean by being constructive in the um, uh, the designing of your assessment. Uh, there are other principles that should guide our practice, not only constructive alignment, uh, which is actually close, uh, close to what we mean by being valid. We also have to consider other principles, like, of course, purpose-driven. You know what you are targeting. You know if it's knowledge that you are targeting or reasoning or product. or skills. Those are, are important because the method of assessment has something to do with the nature of your target the purpose that you have set. You cannot just pick any strategy. There is really what we call as the most appropriate methodology for a certain uh, statement of target. So it is not decided upon by the students, but something that the teacher should be able to tell as the most valid. So we talk of validity you know, when we decide on the method of assessment. Then on the tool, is, is this the tool, for example, if it is testing that is uh, appropriate for uh, assessment of knowledge, what format is most appropriate that could measure all levels of cognitive behavior? Will it be true or false or multiple choice? So you decide again the, the most appropriate. So in all levels of decision making, you always have to ask yourself who or what is the most appropriate. And the closest your decision is to the most appropriate, the more valid your assessment is. So it's really um, a language that is always associated with assessment because that is what we care for when we assess. that The, the quality of the person that we say the person possesses should be the same as the true quality of that person as a result of instruction, which is so difficult to measure actually, but can be approximated using uh, multiple appropriate methodologies, tools, and um, well, the right tasks and items. And the reliability here refers to the consistency you know, of information that we are getting from the same person using the same tool at different time or using uh, parallel tools uh, given at the same time. So that's um, reliability. And then another principle here is the authenticity, the realness of the um, assessment task to what students actually encounter in real life. So the authenticity here is necessary, not only in, let's say, test, but also in performance-based assessment and in other uh, approaches in assessing learning. Fairness, how could we be fair to our students? I think the first thing that could make you fair is making them know what your targets are and what your success indicators are of the attainment of these targets. If you you would uh, assess them after, tell them what your criteria are for evaluation. And this should be with them. 
this criteria should be known by them, the rubric should be with them, and it's not just kept by the teacher or something the teacher um, brings out when it's time to judge the learners. Dapat po nasa kanila na yon, even before they perform the task. Uh, to be student-centered as well, if we talk of tests, normally we prepare a TOS, okay, Table of Specifications, where we structure our tests to ensure that all um, lessons have been covered and all cognitive behaviors that we have developed are also covered. Uh, in Well, in our practice, so this is our common practice, we prepare the TOS before testing. Others would prepare the TOS just for the sake of complying with the requirements of accreditation. They just design the test without it, um, uh, especially if they are not being asked to do it. But to be fair to your students, you have to prepare that. And my recent practice is that my TOS is something I give to my students. It's not just that it's there for me to uh, refer to in the design of my assessment, but something I also share with my students so that they will understand how you design your test. Ah, it's going to be 50 items. Ah, there will be items coming from all these topics. Ah, most of the questions will be essay. Ah, this distributed from remembering to creating. So at least they know how to uh, um, allocate time you know, in preparing for this, especially if it is a graded assessment. So it would be fair to them. So the more fair we are in our practice, the more student-centered we are. So it's not giving away your test. It's just giving your TOS so that they have an idea of how you uh, designed your uh, tool. Uh, so that's uh, one way of showing fairness. It is also fair when the language of your assessment is fair to capture not only the language that they are familiar, not only the language of instruction, but the language that they are familiar with. So we hope that the way they were instructed is somehow the language that they hear, you know, uh, usually in school, outside formal instruction, and when they interact with their classmates. So it is um, gender fair, culture fair, and uh, religion fair, etc. What else? Uh, your assessment should also be inclusive that it could anticipate difficulties. If there are students with learning difficulties, uh, then they should be accommodated as well in the way you designed your assessment and those under uh, difficult circumstances. Next, um, you should also make sure that your assessment is accessible. Like for example, uh, we are into flexible learning modalities. If you say my test will be online, will they have access to it? Will they have uh, the same um, bandwidth? Because if it's going to be synchronous, then they have to be um, experiencing the same assessment conditions. Pare pareho comparable to be fair. Um, if it's going to be face-to-face, -face, pwede ba yun sa lahat? Uh, walang transportation ngayon eh. So, hindi po pwede. Uh, meron naman pala public transportation na ngayon. Pero, hindi masyadong madami. So, that's uh, uh, still a problem too. So, uh, for now, I think we have to be ready with all possibilities no? in providing our assessment. It would be easier for us if there's only one modality, but now that our students have different resources and we do have different resources too as teachers, that we need to be very flexible in the design of our assessment. But that would mean more work from us. So that's the challenge. So we really have to um, strategize on how we could address that. Maybe we collaborate. Uh, those teaching the same course will have to share resources, work together so that they could come up with a menu of possibilities in assessing learning. And assessment should be non-stop. It should be a continuous process. Every time we learn, assessment should be there to tell if we learn or not. And it has to be holistic that we have to cover uh, the totality, not only the cognition, but also the behavior and the affect of the person or all the five learning targets. Or uh, to some, they would say cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. And it has to be balanced, meaning we should not rely on one source alone because please note there is no perfect tool. No, we need to balance all imperfect tools 
So the imperfections of one kasi, of one method, could be complemented by the strengths of another. So combining all these imperfect methodologies and tools will make us more confident in our judgment of our students. And of course, it should be ethical. That when we assess, we have to be sensitive to the, the feelings of our students that we are not here to humiliate them, but we are here to help them know who they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, but not necessarily to highlight, especially their weaknesses. But we could highlight, of course, their strength to give recognition to what they are capable of doing and, as, uh, and add to their source of motivation. Okay? So I'm now moving on to the third one. The approaches in designing assessment is time check, um, 20 minutes before 11. So let's begin with the first one. So I normally uh, follow Kay Burke's way of um, classifying assessment methods. And she uses uh, just three. She classifies methods other than effective. No? Uh, those were grades could come in, uh, traditional performance-based and portfolio. And I'll discuss each one of them uh, in the remaining time of my session. Uh, when we talk of, uh, by the way, I just want to emphasize the arrows here. So the arrows there, the double arrow would uh, again remind us that there is no such thing as perfect assessment. We cannot assess students using traditional methods uh, only. We need to complement this uh, by using other uh, approaches, performance-based, as this one has its own a target to assess as well, and so with portfolio. So they, they have to be um, helping one another. Triangulation is necessary here. Now, when we talk of techniques and tools in assessing learning, so if we talk of traditional common art tests, and we also have the non-test to measure um, knowledge and reasoning using selected response and supply, like uh, I hope you know what I mean by selected response, my choices, multiple choice, true or false, matching type, and the like. And then the supply, the identification type, or fill in the blanks. And uh, these formats of tests, which are normally called objective test formats, are good at assessing knowledge and reasoning. But if we talk of non-tests, uh, if we talk of your feelings, your attitudes, uh, other formats that we normally use could include checklists. So there is a set of characteristics tell which one would pertain to you or a set of um, behaviors that are expected of a of an informed or educated person, which one would uh, speak of you and then you check, etc. Or in a scale from excellent, from poor to excellent, where are you in this level? So that's, that, that is considered a non-test, uh, a non-graded assessment using other formats like scales and checklists. Performance-based could also be classified into two. The task could be those that require demonstration where you could just observe the person without any product at all, any a concrete uh, material is, um, well, uh, coming up with concrete material is not expected. They just have to show by themselves uh, what these skills are that they were able to um, develop, like ability to communicate. That is um, a skill without, without um, concrete, you know, something concrete, unless uh, you put it in... Um, writing, the way you communicate, or ability to socialize or collaborate with others, so and ability to think. So these are, these are performance-based assessments that would uh, require simple demonstration without any concrete evidence. And of course, those that would require creations would be another category. And normally, for demonstrations, we target knowledge, reasoning, skills, and affect, but for creations, products would come in there as part. Uh, portfolio assessment is not so popular, but this is something I do for more than two decades already. I started doing this in 2007 after getting trained at Queensland University of Technology and and um, I, I developed a guide for pre-service teachers and from the time on, I use portfolio assessment. So from undergraduate to PhD level, I, I uh, require portfolio assessment. I use this um, initially as a working portfolio. That means students just keep on collecting all evidences of their learning. And then later on, I just uh, require them documentary and uh, show portfolio. 
And again, when we talk of portfolio, uh, well, the, for performance based, because we, there are tasks there, the, uh, rubrics should be ready, available at the start. That's also true to portfolio assessment, but you can back this up using other measures. That's why we call it uh, multiple measures. As we assess not only the product, but also the process in developing the portfolio. So let's talk about the appropriateness of it. Now I coded uh, two asterisks, those that are very appropriate and one for those that are possible. So these are the learning targets. There are five of them. I'm using K Berg's, uh, uh, I sorry, uh, this is John Macmillan's um, learning target supported by um, Wiggins. I Stiggins rather, Richard uh, Stiggins. Uh, there are five learning targets. And objective test refers to, well, this is the traditional part. You know, and this is very good at assessing knowledge. But when we talk of written tests, uh, essays, for example, they are actually part of performance base and they require rubric as well. They are good at reason, assessing reasoning. Uh, all of the others with uh, one asterisk, they are possible, but the degree of appropriateness is lesser. For performance task with rubric two, uh, maganda siya sa skills. Pwede rin po siya sa product, pero pwede na yan ipasok sa portfolio para hindi, hindi para longer yung time for the students to prepare the work and the work could be of higher quality if they are given more time. And that could be given uh, at a certain point, probably near the completion of the term. And then the self-report for uh, a using skills. And that's very good at the affect or, or disposition of the person. So you see there are many methods, but they vary in their degree of appropriateness. So when you decide on what method to use, consider this. And as to the weight of its uh, source of grade, take note of the um, effectiveness of its method to assess a certain learning target. How do we assess? So we talk of people who to assess. Again, look at this. There are many. Those that are witnesses to one's performance could be credible assessors of learning. Of course, in the classroom, most often the teacher. But we should also consider peers and the students themselves as possible assessors of their own learning. And now that there is home-based instruction, we could consider also parents their, or even their siblings no? uh, or whoever could uh, vouch on what the person uh, was able to do. If, if this is a practicum, so it is work-based uh, in the practicum side, then the personnel, the person uh, deal, deals, with, uh, deals with or dealt with um, could also be a source of uh, assessment, assessment data. And take note uh, of the degree of credibility of this, considering the targets that have been set. Okay, so for teachers, ito siyempre credible. Pero pag pinag-uusapan na yung katauhan, iba pa rin yung self-report. That's the strength of um, the learner no? in assessing his or her own learning, considering his or her own goals. And then peers could come in for skills and products. Parents could come in too. And so with uh, the practicum. Okay, uh, let's move on to... Uh, rules. No? So we talk now of flexible modalities. When we talk of how to assess in flexible modalities, please note that only the modality could change or vary here. But whatever modality, whether that is face-to-face -face or another modality that could be uh, remote, uh, online or offline, make sure that the target set for face-to-face -face should be the same as that of remote. Purposes, principles, approaches, techniques, tools, and assessors should be the same, okay? Um, here is another uh, illustration of how we do it. Uh, in relation to your learning outcomes and uh, your instruction. So imagine yourself, assessment could come in here. Once you have identified your uh, mellows, your most essential learning outcomes, you can start designing your pre-assessment. Okay? If you do away with this, then take the burden of preparing all. But if you have pre-assessment to include what resources the students could uh, access or uh, what uh, platform for instruction is available for them, then this somehow could reduce your preparations. So do a pre-assessment. Do the students have them now, all what you have covered? 
if yes to all, then you can forego instruction and move on to verifying if indeed they met the mellow. So you have to give them, subject them, uh, subject them again to a set of assessments that could uh, be equivalent to testing, to uh, performing a task, no, um, or pro probably providing a portfolio. But if the pre-assessment says not all, uh, just some, then that's where instruction is necessary. Or not at all, still, of course, definitely instruction is necessary. So now you have to think of the modality. So how will you instruct them? Then uh, again, because of the idea of student-centeredness, how they were instructed should be as, as much as possible the same as how they are assessed. Therefore, if you instructed them home-based, then assessment hopefully is also home-based offline. If it is online, then it has to be done that way too. If um, it was done in school, then in the time they are in school, that assessment should happen there as well too. If in the workplace, like it's a practicum, then it should be there and so on. If it, the material was couriered to them because they don't have connectivity, then when they are assessed, they have to send to uh, the, the outputs or what they were able to produce uh, couriered as well. So it's like that. There is connection between uh, how they were instructed and how they are assessed. Okay, um, I just want to put here the others to emphasize. So any combination could be others. It could be a combination of two, offline, online, that's a hybrid, pwedeng alternate, di nagaganon, or pwedeng combination, and so on, of three or more. Then that is where uh, we could uh, include here the others. Okay, next. Uh, another way of looking at things, para lang represented lahat ng possibilities. So I came up with the four quadrants here. So from the face-to-face -face where we see students to be reliant on their teachers to making them uh, self-reliant so they could be at uh, a distance or uh, in a remote place or at home. Uh, these are the things that could happen. So this is the face-to-face -face offline, classroom-based. No? So if we have to instruct them face-to-face, -face, usually assessment happens in the classroom. So all are done this way, printed, actual task with rubric for ABC here, the affect behavior cognition or the five learning targets. And they can do a portfolio with multiple measures which they could exhibit, concrete material that they could exhibit in the classroom. But if it is offline, then you can consider printed materials that are um, sent to them, uh, couriered or videoed materials that sent to them. And if they have to do a performance, they have to video their performance as well and send that back to the teacher. And so with a portfolio assessment. But if it is online, then everything could be online from instruction to assessment. Delivery is online. I'm, I, I, uh, I have been... Uh, handling uh, courses and I've been experimenting on how to deliver a course online, especially that I have students from, for example, at this time, I have students uh, on a tutorial basis though, kasi dadalawa lang sila. One is in Cambodia and another one is in, in Indonesia. And they are taking up a master's degree program in PNU. I don't have to compel them to come to PNU just to take the exam. I do it online. So everything is done online because that's the modality uh, they chose even before pre-COVID happened. No? That, uh, because we are offering uh, online programs, although um, very flexible ang aming modality. That's why we call our college flexible of work of uh, learning and EPNU and that's where I happened to be uh, dean for three years. Uh, I just ended my term in April of this year. Okay. Um, and of course, the combination. If you could combine both, you have Parejo, print and online. Wow, wonderful uh, uh, instruction. How, how exciting instruction could be and how how lucky I would be if I were your students. If I, I could be given options, if I could take it face-to-face um, -face or online, if the situation permits, okay? And um, again, for approaches, I want to show this again, yung uh, appropriateness of the, the um, approach in assessing learning, considering the learning target. So oh, with, let's talk about tests. If the intention of testing is 
as an aid to learning. It's um, a technique, you know, in, in teaching. Pwede po kasi ganun. Parang yung salit na puro review, 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 review. Pero lahat ay test format. Parang ganun, no? A licensure exam, yung mga review classes. Yan yung test na non-graded. So that's possible. Uh, quizzes, exercises are possible. Lahat yan pwede. Kasi non-graded naman yan. Wala namang problema. No? You can experiment on this. Tas, o oh, sige lang, go, go, go. Apply all. Basta non-graded. But when it comes, excuse me, to a graded assessment, that's where we have to be very careful in our decision. How are we going to assess them if assessment results here are to be graded? For test, well, school base is um, at least uh, safe ka dyan because you can monitor. You can proctor your own test. You can provide them the same testing conditions. The same classroom, air condition kung air condition o wala. At least pare-pareho sila. Comparable yung testing conditions. Ika nga. So that would be fair to all because we're talking of fairness here. But if it is home-based, mahirap yun kasi iba-iba ang kakayahan ng mga bata at ang resources nila at home. Kaya medyo lesser ang uh, comparability, when we talk of the comparability of the conditions, hindi maganda masyado kung home-based ang test. Home-based yung online. No? Uh, pwede kung synchronous, pero minsan may issue pa rin dyan kasi yung bandwidth. Well, let's say sabay-sabay sila. Open the LMS. Okay, at this uh, time, you open natin yung exam and it closes at this time. Sabay-sabay tayo at naka-on ang camera nyo. Then that's good. I can see you synchronously. But if it's done asynchronously and this is a test, Nako, this could be prone to cheating. This is where uh, you could doubt uh, to a little extent yung um, uh, integrity of results. Kaya uh, think twice before you make a decision on this. And then, um, of course, blended uh, kung ano ang mas appropriate. Basta ang issue dyan, fairness. Na pare-pareho sana, hopefully, yung testing conditions. Don't change the standards. The criteria that you have set should stay as is, whatever modality that is employed. No? Uh, in terms of task, maganda ang school-based kasi nakikita mo nga rin, pwede rin po home-based, offline, basta task, kanya-kanya uh, sila ng time. Siguro bigyan mo sila ng period na let's say after two weeks, then you have to be ready showing this. Yung ganon, hindi naman necessarily within the class time that uh, we, we have set. Uh, or schedule uh, usually in a face-to-face -face modality. And then um, for home base, uh, again, better if the task is done asynchronously. Kasi napakahirap on the part of the teachers, let's say sabay-sabay, but parang yung kanina, uh, nag-shift nag ako. I can only see a few in one screen, let's say 50. Then in another screen, kailangan kong i-click another 50. So ang hirap ng monitoring kung synchronous lahat sabay-sabay at the same time. Maganda medyo asynchronous, medyo scheduled. Maybe group one first, this period, then another group and, uh, at another time. So that's that somehow is asynchronous as not all students are tested at the same time. Then for portfolio assessment, maganda rin po lahat except for, again, I, I don't recommend synchronous assessment for performance-based assessment and portfolio. I go for a synchronous assessment for that and blended, that's perfect, no? As uh, it would be um, what uh, open to whatever is uh, feasible to all. All right. Uh, let's talk about how online assessment is done. Of course, you are already familiar with paper and, pes, uh, paper and pen assessment. So I'll focus more on online assessment and some points for comparison. So what would make online assessment better if all have connectivity? Uh, I would really go for it. No, why? Of course, when we talk of medium, uh, ano ba, marami. Pwedeng print kasi yan, text, graphics, kung may graphics pa ay hindi colored kasi mahal, pictures hindi rin colored, black and white. But if it is online, lahat ng colors gusto mo ilagay mo. No? Pati video, may links and sounds pa, pwede. Number of assesses, just enough that you can accommodate in the classroom. Like if there will be face-to-face um, -face assessment this coming school year, mare-reduce na lang. Narinig ko sa DepEd, i-re-reduce na. Usually ay 30 in a classroom pag testing. Ngayon, gagawin na lang ata ng half na lang. Yung mga ganun ba? So it, it depends on the size of the classroom. So sometimes it limits the number of people you can um, 
test at the same time. While in online, if everybody has access to the LMS, for example, if it is set up in the LMS, then they could all uh, be tested at the same time. Like in, in our program for DOSC, 1,000 teachers all over the country, 17 regions, they could all be tested at the same time. Pwedeng ganon, no? Na, na set up. Scoring is, of course, very fast because you can automate the key and the, the um, response, you know, could be captured right away and even the analytics could be given. And um, the feedback is uh, something we could quick, quickly give as well. You know? And uh, in terms of integrity, I put here question mark because sometimes there's an issue in testing, especially if it is not well proctored. And uh, again, the platform uh, of students vary. No? May maganda, mayroong hindi. Connectivity is not also comparable to all. All right. I did also a uh, further uh, survey on the comparison between and among LMS and forms that I could use for assessment. So I asked some people to help me um, identify the features of the platforms that they are used to just to make sure that uh, at least I could share this uh, survey that I did. So I look at three platforms. One is Schoology. This is managed by Rex Bookstore. Uh, Mapua has Blackboard. Um, our black our LMS is model based. Uh, this is a free black, uh, LMS. And in terms of forms, uh, I I really look at these two forms. There's Google form. We are probably more familiar with it. But uh, I explored recently MS forms. The ones that I use here are more on MS forms. I prefer MS form uh, for now. No, probably if there are improvements in. Uh, Google, the way I want it, as a designer of assessment, there are things that I prefer in MS Forms that I don't see in Google Forms. So these are the things that I examine, what, what these platforms are capable of doing when, when it comes to format of assessment. So you see, if there's a blank here, the, the person I talked to who provided me such data was not confident in checking. So... He's not sure whether that is present, so I just put it here that he's uh, not confident uh, to provide such information. So let it be discovered by whoever uses it. No, so That will be the contribution of um, those of you who are familiar with the platform. Then um, this one, see, uh, this one is, uh, sabi nila, integrated na dalawang... Ano yun? Blackboard po ata sa kanila plus meron pa silang sarili na, na in-integrate. But some features are still missing which we could see in a paid uh, platform. Ito yung kagandahan ng, ng mga platforms. Merong libre, katulad namin libre kami, walang binabayaran sa model, pero ito may bayad. Pero mas mamaya titignan natin, mas maraming features. So yun yung kagandahan. Kung may kakayahan ang mga bata... At ang school, may resources naman, baka po pwedeng mag-subscribe. Kasi mas madaming pwedeng magawa sa paid um, uh, platform or LMS. Pero pag libre, kulang abad, di doon muna tayo sa libre. Ganon. Wala namang pilitan. Basta ang mahalaga, meron tayong LMS na nakokontrol natin as, uh, as uh, administrators. Alright. Um, it's 11. All right. Let me show you this. I hope this is uh, helpful to you. Uh, you could not see this in, uh, well, I don't know. I, I have not tried finding out if I could see this, avail this information available in the internet. But I did my own survey of this just to make sure that what I present here is something fresh uh, that I believe working. Okay. Uh, feedback. Ayan, yung mga gusto ko kasi yun ang pinakamaganda sa online, yung feedbacking. Imagine in the classroom, you have to give individual feedback to 40 students. Can you do that? Iba-iba ang needs nila. Mauubos talaga oras mo, feedbacking pa lang. But if it is automated and you are very kind in giving your feedback to every, let's say, option in your test, then it's easy. You don't have to be there doing it if it's already programmed in your uh, system of uh, assessment. Okay? So look at this. Time in answering. Yan, mahalaga din yan. It can be time. No? Na pa para makontrol, hindi at your own, especially if it, this is done synchronously. Yung iba pwedeng i-time yung per item or 
yung the whole test. So, tingnan natin, halimbawa ito, you can uh, set the time in answering every item sa mga paid uh, LMS. Sa mga hindi, wala. Uh, hindi clear. They, they are not confident saying, parang wala yan. So, parang ganun din ang message nung pag walang, ano, uh, walang check. No? Uh, number of times in answering can be controlled. Yes, that, that's possible too. Viewing of the test created, yes, there are um, exams which require you to answer them first before you could view the whole test again. But if you are the administrator, you could always go back to um, the, the parang working file mode. Now, data analytics, we don't usually have this in face-to-face, -face, but this is very powerful in online assessment. The provision for the analysis of data you don't you just interpret it's already organized and uh, presented to you naka graph na may frequency count na you don't have to do that you just have to interpret and use the data to improve your instruction in the practice of your assessment so these are the things that can be done pwede ka pang um, mag date uh, you know data mining you can do sort of research from your own data because you could generate excel from the use of all these platforms for testing uh, yeah and some more some could even present the tool in different formats like url or it could be emailed or the qr code that you saw in ms forms it can be sent by a computer or viewed by a computer or mobile phones now uh, again i recommend if you are capable of doing it platforms with a lot of features uh, especially those features that are necessary in assessment that like you can do performance the rubric could be given there you can modify the rubric you can uh, differentiate scoring of the rubric you can uh, ask the students to develop a portfolio there is a platform for them to develop their uh, learning portfolio okay and that i saw in one platform that's in rex money's uh, schoology how do we design an online test? So that's how our next question. How you design a pen and paper assessment? It's the same as that of online. Kasi iba lang naman yung platform. And based on my experience uh, as a um, professor of online testing, I would still go first for preparation of this in paper. I would say in format as if it's in um, to be printed that students have to take. And then that would be easy for, for online, you know, um, transforming it into an online test. Kasi pwede mong ipagawa yung ano eh, yung pag -e encode sa LMS or sa form, basta meron ng guide na valid and reliable uh, paper-based uh, tool. If you are running out of time, pwedeng ipagawa mo. Ito yung pagawa naman sa LMS nito, iset up mo yan. Because that's also time-consuming, setting up. No, the test, the items in the set in the LMS or in the form would also require time. It's like when you prepare pen and paper. But at least if you have already the pen, paper, pen and paper, because that's what you have at present, as you, you have been teaching the course for so many years and, and you will be teaching the same course this coming school year. Yun lang platform lang, uh, modality lang ang challenge sa Then at least uh, valid na. Make sure na okay na siya. And then what you will just add with some others could not do ay yung feedback so when you uh, look at the work na uh, in the um, online platform it, that is where you could come in to again do the proofreading of the work and giving um feedback if you could uh, do that in paper the well and good para i automate na lang din iba na somebody could help you set up the test somebody you can trust but uh, again for graded assessment it should go through this process it requires still a framework for your assessment, which should be parallel to the framework of your curriculum. Then it has to go through um, review from the TOS that you prepare down to the items that you have written, validation by experts. If you are not confident to do it yourself, that should be um, a welcome idea too. And then this has to undergo revision. If you can pilot, do it. If not, take your own test at least and see, you know, what uh, happens as you take it, the, the, the 
actions the time needed in taking it could somehow tell you too no how much time your students would be needing uh, from you if you give your exam if let's say you design a test for one hour and it took you one hour to take also your test then please reduce your test because your time in taking it as the designer should just be one third of the time students would be needing when they take your exam. So that is in the absence of pilot testing. Kasi sa pilot testing, yung swali, tinitingnan natin yan. Kaya ba within the period of assessment that you have set? Yung let's say number of items that you put there in the exam. And then of course, this should be analyzed. And again, if it is online, you don't have to do this. It's automatic and you just have to interpret and use the data to improve uh, your plans and the delivery of your instruction. And then it goes to uh, making it, if this is standardized, usually it ends up with a manual on how to use it so that uh, you know, anybody uh, giving the test would observe the same conditions in the administration of the test. Now, for for other details, I want to promote that they, I have read co-authored a book on assessment in learning. This is a mandated course in teacher education programs defined in TED Memo 74 to 82, except 81. Um, there are uh, two assessment courses required. There assessment in learning one and two. I have... Um, co-authored this with people I uh, work with at PIMEA. If you have heard of PIMEA, this is the professional organization for those who are enthusiasts in educational measurement and association. And I'm heading this uh, organization at present. But my co-authors are officers as well of the organization coming from different institutions. So there are more details there because assessment in learning one is more on designing uh, pen and paper tests or written assessment na hindi pa namin na-capture yung mga online, but the format is open to online and blended uh, learning. That, that would be a good reference. Now, in our book, I, we showed there an example of a, of a table of specifications for guidance of probably those who are not used to do doing this. So meron din siyang instructional time. I, we programmed this to anticipate the number of hours for the delivery of the course. Let's say this is 45 hours, excluding the orientation and other activities. This, this would refer to instructional time. And how did we allocate number of items per lesson? So this will tell you that the number of items would should be uh, proportional to the amount of instruction you spend for a lesson. And that this could be this distributed across levels of cognitive behavior. So that when you look at the bottom, that represented all levels of cognitive behavior. So this is this is an example you could see in the book. Um, also in the book, so I said, we have a, a TOS, Table of Specifications, for the summative test that we put there. But we already actually anticipated the possibility of students uh, preferring to take the exam online. So there is an exam in the book, it's printed, but the same uh, set of items could be seen as well in the link, in a Google form. So there is a corresponding Google form that goes with the test if students prefer uh, taking the exam online. So this is the format. We require um, assessment of four C. So we want students to explain their answer and not just picking one from a set of choices. So this is where we want to um, check on the development of their uh, critical thinking, their ability to communicate. No? Another format you could actually uh, offer here is to put letter E where you ask them to give their own preferred answer. Like what I gave you uh, earlier in my example, don't limit uh, students' responses to what you thought uh, they could think of, no? Baka pwedeng yung hindi mo na-anticipate, ilagay mo na rin dyan. let it be letter E. E na hindi pa yan nandiyan kasi it's an option where students could provide their own response para mas flexible na flexible yung language nila ilagay nila if they want. As long as the content is there and um, the response reflect uh, understanding of what uh, you ha actually delivered uh, in relation to your objectives. Now, in the same book, uh, I'm showing this as a reference kasi ganito po ang demand sa online assessment. 
in every test you make, you should give a rational. For example, here is a multiple choice. If I chose letter A, what does it mean if I pick A? What does that tell about my understanding of what I learned? There should be a corresponding rational. Wag lang sabihin, this is wrong. Congratulations, you are right. Wag ganon. Isabihin natin, what could be the misconception? So we have to educate them. So this is, this is where assessment becomes... Uh, Assessment for learning. No? The, the way we do assessment aims to help students learn more, not only to certify what they have learned, but to use assessment as well as a scaffold, scaffold to learning more. No? No? So uh, we have to be generous here. So the, the rationale that we put here, uh, again, this is pre-COVID work. Nilagyan namin ko, letter A, ano ang reason bakit uh, one point? Now, this is something we cannot do in online. The framework that we use in our book is the SOLO framework. If you heard of SOLO, Structure of Observed Learning Outcomes, the options in the test could be differentiated in scoring. That Let's say a, a certain option could represent a certain level of understanding. So the solo gives us five levels of understanding. The first is pre-structural. That is a response which is totally wrong. Let's say in A to D, meron dyan zero ang score kasi totally wrong. Or one point would mean pre-structural that, that is partially correct. It's close to incorrect. But at least there is an idea that one could assume uh, one knows. The, the, the assessor could assume the learner knows. Uh, hindi nga lang fully correct. No? Pero re, get, getting there to understanding fully the idea. Uh, then the next layer is the multi-structural. That is uh, coded to here. Ibig sabihin, mas greater yung chance na maging correct compared dun sa uni-structural because you see two or more ideas correct but still not the best to respond to the question. And the, the next level, the fourth level, is the relational. This is the correct answer to the question. So in a uh, four, four, uh, four, fourth choice, no? uh, instrument, multiple choice with four choices, the best answer there could be considered relational, and that is coded here, three. Uh, but we have another layer in solo, and that is called the extended abstract. But this is the response which could not be just picked from the choices given by the teacher. It is a response where students have to provide their own, not borrowing the language of the teacher, but providing their own response using their own language. So imagine now this multiple choice. If I have to modify this, this will have letter E. And letter E is the portion for the students to give their own response instead of just choosing from the given choices. And if I follow the solo model, I could code that response if it is correct for. So that means the points I could give here for item one could be the maximum could be four. But in the format I did, it's just three. Okay, so that's that's a model that I want you to consider not only in the design of your pen or uh, paper-based assessment, but also in online assessment, if possible. Unfortunately, I could not find yet uh, a platform or an LMS that could accommodate this feature. Uh, let's have one example of an online assessment. So I, I gave this link to Sir Neil uh, earlier on before I started. I hope you could access this link. Again, if you have your QR uh, enabled, try to access this form. So let us see it. Okay, we have time. It's, it's uh, 11.20. Please access that form. Sir Neil, kindly share the link. Okay, I yeah, hope so, sure uh, I you. hope you are, Ma'am Sir Neil. Can you share the link? I saw a request for links. Yes, Ma'am. Na na po, Ma'am. Okay, thank you. Sa Zoom. Thank you, dear. Okay, so while waiting, 
titingnan natin kung sino yung sumasagot. So let me check. So uh, this one has 30 points, but this does not mean it has 30 items. I used uh, solo here, so that means the code, solo codes from zero to three were applied. The instructions were given. I have an illustration on how to respond. So when you design your test, kung pwede pati example ng pagsasagot, you model the answer. So this is, I think, one thing we have to practice as well. Don't just give the uh, answer, let's say A, or don't just simply give instructions how to do it. But if you could also provide a model answer, especially for constructed response, para alam na mga, ah, ganito pala itsura ng excellent. Ah, ganito pala worth five points. If you could do that. So I modeled here how it is done to improve our practice. All right, so may apat ng sumagot. Apat pa lang. Okay, ang maganda dito while uh, dating, Meron kang Excel. If I open this, makikita nyo ang dami data. That could already be a source of data for research. Classroom-based research. Pag-aralan ninyo. Ano ba mga misconceptions sa mga sidyante nyo? Meron na rin data analytics. Meron ng item analysis dito. Ano yung walang napili, hindi effective distractor. Ano yung effective distractor? So, so konti lang nag-response. Siguro pagod na, no, sir? Anyway, kung pagod na, Takasasagot, let me just explain what I want to um, put here. So in the question form, when you design your test, yung sinasabi ko, design it such that every option has a corresponding feedback. So ito, hindi yung generic feedback. Okay, so there is an explanation. Why is this given one point? Why not two points or three points? So there is an explanation. This is the correct answer. Okay. Now, you can, you can explore MS forms. One thing I like about MS forms, pwede kaya dito. Let me check. Ayan. This is what I like in forms. You cannot do this in paper modality. Look at this. Uh, this is quite long. And at for those students who have problem in reading, they could just listen. Okay, I can change this to mail. And best answer is given three points. A response that is totally wrong is given zero point. A response that is I can make it slowly. One idea that is known slash correct will be given one point. I a can make it a little bit faster. The best answer will be given two points. Add that too fast. An additional two, two points if you could give an acceptable justification for your chosen answer. Okay, a little bit. Will be based so you can adjust. Of acceptability of your justification. Add that too slow. <laughs> Teacher M prepared a table of specifications as her guide in developing a lesson. Is this correct? All right. So Just that's that's another feature of the form, of this form. That's why I said I like MS forms because I did not see this uh, feature in Google Forms. So there is this immersive reader facility. Okay. So that's not that's not something I uh, recorded. It's automatic. So once you have written the text, there is already a corresponding uh, audio aid uh, device there, which is where we uh, they applied artificial intelligence. So that's AI. And for every item here, there's uh, AI uh, added. Lagging ganon. One, which okay. So that's good, right? Do you like that feature? I like that feature. I don't have that in, in Google Forms. 
and I hope kung meron sana ay ma-address, no? And uh, and then if you notice because the format that I want uh, in the printed, remember the printed down below every item I ask them to explain their choice. Uh, this is my problem with uh, available forms. You cannot remove the number. This should just be one number, but then it's automatic that the next um, format that you use there uh, is numbered, you know, uh, as, as shown here, sequentially as shown here. So I cannot remove. I don't know if that could be adjusted, but it appears that uh, the test is long because it, the, even the explanation, if ever uh, you need to explain this to earn two more points, is numbered. So that's the intention. Now, another feature that I want to add here is the possibility of adding pictures na colored, na mas nakaka-enhance sa presentation, na mas mukhang catchy. Uh, ma ma enjoy yan ng mga sudyante, kahit mga matatanda na sila. And then, May videos. I don't want to play this anymore kasi baka maghang. But this is uh, a real one. No? Uh, pwede kong i-click anytime. I'm just uh, worried na baka maghang. And then you submit. So that's MS form. Let's go back. So, wow! Ang dami na rin sumagot. Ay, hindi pala. Ito pala yung kanina. Okay. Okay, so... Kala ko yung test ko sinagutan niya. Marami ba? Kanya? Marami pa nag-attempt sumagot? O napagod na? Only 10? Okay. That's understandable. Baka gutom na. So for those who were not able to access it, I hope you saw the feature that I like in that part. Um, and then, of course, you can change the background. You can personalize it. You can put your picture if you want. Or you can just take uh, available templates from the form and then uh, points are reflected so you can modify this ah, I should have shown that part anyway we can go back. anyway you can put the um, in the portion for feedback and you can put or uh, indicate the points you want there and then ito yung kaninang AI no? na video ko in case na hindi mag work yung ano niya yung ganong feature niya. And then, uh, ay, okay. Stop. It's the same thing that I showed a while ago. It worked anyway, so I don't want to show that anymore. And then multiple uh, answers are possible. Uh, you can also add mathematical symbols. Mahirap po kasi mag-provide ng test na may mga mathematical symbols, so that's included. You can shuffle items. It allows integration of pictures and videos. And it also directs you to Creative Commons, if ever. Now, you have to get pictures. Dadalhin ka niya na kagad sa Creative Commons. Hindi kung saan-saan ka pakukuha. Ganon. So, you are safe. Especially if this is for instructional purposes anyway. Not for commercialized purposes. And then, how are the answers? So, ayan. Dito pwede mong ma-modify. Pwede mong i-automate three points. Pero kasi nga I'm using solo framework, every option has a corresponding code. Pwede kong ilagay yon. That's something you have to key in. Kasi hindi pa kayang i-automate. Hindi kaya ng MS forms. If you can come up with a program for that, uh, for this uh, uh, framework of assessment, design of assessment that you have, then that's better. Then the feedbacking that I said a while ago, that it's possible to give a feedback per option, not only the generic feedback. It gives you the score per point, uh, per item, so that this uh, reminds you of the value or weight of its item you are answering, and not only the total. And then uh, you can add more feedback if you want. So this is really what I like and what I look for in the design of a student-centered assessment that if ever the generic feedback is there to help and you saw something unique in the, resp in the response of your student, you can add more to it. So there's a provision for that. Well, probably that depends on your time. And then you can view responses. You can uh, post uh, their rep the report. Maganda siguro balikan natin, no? Kasi hindi ko na ipakita sa inyo yung part niyo. 
uh, let me just uh, bring you back to this. Kasi yung forms, yung parts na yun. Let me just show. Parang meron naman 21. Ayan. So may 21 respondents. Uh, let's look at their work. So you can review. So when I say review, so alimbawa, uh, anyway, coded naman sila. Respondent 8. She got 12 over 30. So automated na, na, na nakuha niyo yung sagot, 3 points. Hindi ko na yan. Tapos sasabihin sa iyo, review this. Review. Kasi nga, hindi kaya ng system i-automate yung checking sa constructed response. So, you can now check. So, emergent because the assessment is as if only intended for looking just a mere knowledge-based effect of instruction. Uh, sige, generous naman ako. Pwede na yan. So, yan. Two points. So, nadagdagan. Two points. So, one is indeed an exam. Okay, very good. So, two points. Dadagdag. Then, oh, automated. Nakuha niya lahat. Ito, which of the following processes? So, I gave four points here. Pinili niya kasi ay yung mga mali. Nako, bakit kaya? Ah, nakuha naman niya yung... Which of the following are ideal to be done by the student when they develop their portfolio? Set the competence or... Do the evidence. So, ano ba yon? Ano ba yung pinrogram ko? Lahat naman ata, yan pwede. So, halimbawa, may dalawa lang siyang tinik. Two ngayon, I can modify. Okay? So, yun yung kagandahan. Modifiable yung scoring. Which I did not see possible in others. Of course, hindi ka na yan sinagot. So, that's fine. There is a review portion. Then I can go back. What else can it offer? Ayan, may post your score. So, meron ka pang report for each one. So, if I open uh, respondent 8, uh, tingnan na natin. O, oh, ayan ang maibibigay mo sa kanya. Meron siyang mare-receive na report. Nandito yung tanong, kaya niyang i-review pa yan. Tama ba yung pinili ko? But you have to be careful here. As the assessor, kasi ay, ano ba ito? Ganito pala. Ma ay, mali ito. Dapat to. Bakit kaya ganyan? They could question your assessment. So you have to be ready. Kaya uh, make uh, a good uh, and quality test and the justification should be convincing so that when they get back the results, Kasi you can, you can uh, send this to them. This is their um, report. It shows how many they got, no? 18, and the number of points they got per item. So that's the kind of report they could give. Uh, you could give to them or they could receive from you from using this form. So this is the MS form. So and dami, di ba, ginawa ko ba yan? Hindi. Automatic na. That's the advantage of online assessment. Okay, so I hope uh, that's clear to you. Let's move on. So, mm -hmm. let's uh, try another uh, format. Let's try Google. So, ito pa, the one thing I like here is the QR code. Nawala sa Google form. Ito naman si Google. I will not open anymore. I think we are more accustomed to using Google form. Uh, but I want to highlight the part in Google form that I like you know, as an assessor. So, of course, you can do also the same format. May multiple choice din siya. And you can also give feedback. But the kind of feedback in Google online is different from that of MS forms. Look at the feedbacking component of Google. Um, here is a set. It only requires you feedback for the correct answer. So this is the correct answer. And then one feedback for all the rest. So there's only one set you could uh, give. Generic na whether it's going to be A, B, or D. So medyo masalimuot kasi hindi masyadong uh, uh, useful yun dun sa sumagot sa let's say A. Pero yung feedback ay parang referring to B and so on. So, hindi masyadong customized dun sa option. So, that's one thing I did not like in Google Form, which I saw possible and that makes MS Form better. Now, ang isa naman na gusto ko sa Google Form is this part. In the feedback component, so although I said there's only one box for all the incorrect answers, you can add naman some materials. Let's say you were wrong in... Uh, answering number uh, one. 
And to reinforce your understanding of the lesson behind number one, I could add links. I could add videos. Ito, this was taken from YouTube. If I click this, uh, ililink ka niya sa YouTube explaining to you your mistake. What is alternative assessment? And why did you pick the wrong uh, response here? And why not alternative? So you are now informed more of the idea of alternative assessment. So there is a reinforcement of the assessment results. So that is something you can also um, uh, get from Google form, which is good as uh, I don't see that in other forms. So talagang, you have to be familiar with different formats or different platforms or with different forms and pick the one that matches your design as an assessor. Okay, now let's visit this time LMS. Kanina puros forms ang ginamit ko. So this time, uh, I want you to see how we use our LMS. This is the model-based LMS, which is a free LMS that we use in the university. And we use this in our programs. Uh, I directed the DOST uh, DepEd program, which PNU led in partnership with LNU and other members of the network. And in our program to them, we included their because the ones that we are training are DepEd teachers who are non-licensed. They are DOST scholars taken by DepEd as defined in RA 106.12 and as allowed by R105.33. Uh, and we set up um, a review, sort of review session for them so that uh, the chance of passing the licensure exam is greater after they have uh, been trained by the university. So, and, it, and its partners. So, meron kaming exams na, na parallel to that as their uh, material for review. And again, these are teachers all over the 17 regions in the country who are adept at, they are um, teaching senior high school uh, in specialized areas where there is dearth of teachers, uh, where there are dearth of teachers and um, they are uh, on scholarship, being trained to take six professional education courses so that in the end they could take the licensure exam. And we set up, on our training with them is online. So our assessment is online as well. So pwede mong i-visit ng ganyan. So let's say English proficiency. So nandito yung may instructions kami sa kanila, may welcome message from me and the components of the let, some information. And uh, the number, parang sort of TOS ng lahat na nandito na items nila, what they cover, and then do's and don'ts when participating in this program, what they should do, what they should observe, what they should not do, do not copy the items shown in the platform, do not take photograph, do not take video, do not print the screen, do not let anybody answer the exercise for you, do not reveal the key to corrections to others. Hindi pa, hindi pa ako na naging enough doon. I even asked them to sign a non-disclosure. No? So may non-disclosure pa sila. Tapos the contents of the non-disclosure are seen here. Okay? And so on. So for example, nag-send sila. Okay, let me click this one. Tapos pwede pa nila ma-access yung non-disclosure na yan. So meron silang form that they have to sign. So let's make it big para makita. So non-disclosure agreement. Okay, so that's me. This is to assure PNU that I have not done the following. Tick all. I did not copy, blah, 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 blah. Dapat di mo ginawa yan. Otherwise, hindi kita uh, bibigyan ng access doon <laughs> pag hindi mo ginawa yan. So, then you submit. So that's the non-disclosure part. Okay? Uh, so we set up. Okay. Living. So... And, and a lot more, of course, uh, kasi nga ay online kami, marami kami dyan uh, test na given to them online. So that's general education, meron din kami professional education, lahat ng nandiyan dyan. Uh, hindi ito graduate ng PNU po, no? they are not only from PNU but all over the country. So, meron kaming, ayan, yung mga naging speakers niya ay naging facilitator. So, we set up um, our our materials online. And this is online assessment. Okay? This is an example of that. Now, uh, 
it's almost 12, so let's move on. So you have seen an example of online assessment done in the LMS. So I hope uh, you have an idea how we do it. So take note of that, non-disclosure. Now some issues that we should be able to address when we do online assessment integrity of the test results. So again, the issue is that it could be prone to cheating. So design well your test. Some would even design a test na open yung book. Ibig sabihin talagang answers could not be found in the book. Kaya you can open your book. So you have to assess high-level thinking skills. And you can shuffle the items. You can time the administration of the test. You can let the students turn on their camera. You can disable. May mga ganun, disable browsers and applications and sign honesty form. When I was doing my online assessment, pag hindi, pag hindi pwede doon sa form, no, hindi ko pa masyadong alam ang form, meron akong ganito. It's integrated in my exam that I sent to my students. Um, via email pa lang nga ito noon eh, no? So, nung nag-fail kami sa LMS namin, I sent my test in the email and then in their email, they have to, um, when they receive this, they have to uh, sign the pledge. It says here that they have not uh, copied or they have not shared their answers to anybody. Okay? Now, I discovered a testing company that uh, observes a very high testing protocol. Dinidisable nila lahat. Kaya nila, there's a software that they do na lahat ng mga connections mo sa Google and all other uh, web uh, search engines are disabled once you've started taking the test. Tapos naka-monitor siya sa inyo. And then again, for other details that I miss that you probably are interested to know, just refer to the book that I mentioned. Now, as to the performance-based assessment, I want to give you another example, but in the interest of time, uh, pwede hindi na. Pero siguro ko, quickly, pwede rin, kailang quarter na. Sige, wag na lang po. Pakapagod na po kayo. Uh, but, but you know what I, I wanted to do here? Uh, papagawa ko sana sa inyo. Parang yung ginawa ko kanina na pick pack boom. It's a simple demonstration and that's performance-based. no? And that could be done to synchronously like this if you want. But uh, all cameras are on. So you can use this platform for assessment um, in performance-based way. And the rules usually for performance basis, again, you have to set your competency that should be known to the students, then describe well the, the tasks that they have to do. The rubric should be given to them. You know, it should be shared with them and not uh, just at the end, but even at the start so that they could participate in the finalization. If there are parts that are unclear to them, then this could still be modified until um, the rubric reaches its uh, clarity you know, at the level of the learners. Then the performance and then the evaluation after. Now, I want to compare here two kinds of rubrics. So we have the holistic rubric. Uh, in, in the exercise that we did a, a while ago, I can set more criteria. I set only correctness and speed, but I could add more to it like I need to mag work. Correctness of the order, out. Yeah. Completeness of the actions, out. Then, so correctness of the timing, yes, that is uh, needed. Dun sa exercise natin kanina na pick-pack boom, yung gusto ko sana idagdag would cover all this. Uh, hindi ko lang alam kung you will appreciate, pero I, I hope I had enough time para quick ano lang, hand movements lang naman sana. But give me a signal if you are still interested. But anyway, uh, again, so I can accommodate questions. Ang pinapakita ko po dito, uh, balikan natin, wait lang, wait lang. Uh, this one, I have four levels here. But once you once the level of proficiency is clear, that means all these criteria were satisfied and there is a portion here, others, please specify, that could accommodate higher levels of proficiency. When students could add more qualities than those that you have initially set. So, alimbawa, uh, gusto ko sanang ipagawa ay exercise na pwedeng may sarili kayong interpretation. Hindi lang yun nanggaling sa akin. And if I see the interpretation appropriate, then that could qualify to recognizing your level of proficiency as highly proficient. Alimbawa, may actions ako tapos kumanta pa kayo bukod sa ginawa niyo yung actions na yun, abay tumaas yung level sa sinet kung uh, proficiency level and that becomes highly proficient. So that is where you could accommodate uh, other things that students have learned from instruction para yung emergent assessment na sinasabi, even the unintended are captured and considered. 
So dito pumapasok yung emergent assessment. When you make your assessment uh, open to accommodate other things students have learned that you have not anticipated that they would learn in the process of instruction. I showed uh, holistic, but it can be made analytic. So let's look at the difference. So correctness of the actions, kapag na-meet lahat yan, o oh, sige, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But if you want to be very analytic and more generous in giving feedback to your students, pwede mong gawing, let's say, four-point scale, ang bawat criterion. So each criterion is rated independent of another criterion. So you can, one could get, Four points in one criterion and three points in another criterion. So that's how analytic rubric is done. And that is necessary in performance-based assessment. Again, for details, we have another book. This is Assessment in Learning 2, again, mandated by CHED. And this one focuses on alternative methods in assessing learning. And when we say alternative, this refers to na, uh, the performance-based, affective, and portfolio assessment. Okay? How do we do portfolio assessment? So I'll show you quickly what are the transformation, the evolution in the practice of portfolio assessment. I said for more than two decades that I've been using this when I started, mga papel, ganito ang portfolio ng mga estudyante ko. And then nag-transform, na uso na ang online, pwede na ang computer, digital. So naka-CD yung mga outputs nila. And then pwede rin sa web. And then pwede rin sa LMS. Let's show one example. Okay. One thing I like about portfolio assessment is that it covers more uh, learning targets no, from knowledge down to affect, although it's not also perfect, just like the other modalities. But in terms of complexity, mas marami na ko cover because this is a portfolio of all evidences of learning from day one to the last day of your course. And it is guided by principles of content learning and equity, meaning you cannot just put there anything that is not relevant or related to the course. It has to be uh, reflective of the curriculum you were exposed to. And it could vary in forms, pwedeng working tentative uh, portfolio mo yan until it reaches the portion of uh, showing your best works. That's the show portfolio. The process is similar to performance-based. You need to know your uh, goals, the, the competencies you are targeting. Pwede po pag product-based ang, ang performance-based assessment nyo. Pwedeng lahat yung pwede nang maging bahagi ng portfolio. So ang practice ko po ay uh, may rubric na ako sa simula pa lang, what I expect in their portfolio. Then they do this as um, lesson progresses and then it ends with a, uh, a portfolio exhibit at the end of the course. I'll show you examples. The heart of portfolio assessment is students' reflections. Kaya strong ito sa self, uh, no, yung disposition. Ito yung mga examples ng mga maano-manong portfolio ko nung mga unang panahon. Uh, ayan, ganyan ang itsura pa niya noon. Pero ngayon, digital na lang po. CD. At yung iba, electronic na lang po ang sinesend sa akin. I'll show you samples later on. This is an example of digital portfolio. Nasa CD at from the cover of the CD, may explanation what the cover tells and all the parts were justified. Pati videos na nag-conduct sila ng professional sharing, nandiyan na and all evidences of what they did. Okay, so I'll click this one. This is the latest uh, portfolio that my students did. It is an electronic portfolio. It does not require a CD. They just sent to me the, the, uh, the link and then uh, you can open the link. Okay. Hope it works. So look at how they organize things. Uh, ayan, so a profile nila. Lahat ito ginawa namin sa klase. Okay, so alimbawa mag-visit tayo ng isa. May professional sharing. So I ask them to share with their colleagues whatever they learn from the class. So when you look at their work, and dito yung proof of their professional sharing. I was not there. They did this by themselves. Naggrupo lang sila by twos, by threes. Tapos and dito yung proof. Nasaan? Ayan. Uh, 28 pages. Oh no? So and dami. So ito ay... Ito yung diniscuss nila, may registration sila, ayan yung mga attendees nila, nag-start sila ng opening prayer, ito yung program nila, may national, andito lahat yung proof. So, para ka na rin nandu doon sa professional sharing nila, nakita mo yung actual na gawa nila. Kasi they put all the evidences here. And then who talk, what did they talk, what they, what they discussed. So, there were uh, evidences of what they did and that's part of their portfolio 
and uh, I were I, I was able to guide them on how to do it through my rubric. So the rubric should really be like uh, a way of communicating already your ex expectations. So ganito lahat, no? magkakaiba lang ng packaging, pero yung uh, what I want to see in the portfolio is set uh, at the start and negotiated yung packaging and all others that they want to include. Okay? So I, I have a lot of that. Now, uh, I'll show you this time. So you have seen an electronic portfolio. Maraming akong examples niyan. Pero wala na tayong time. This time, I want you to see this an LMS where portfolio is also possible. This is not possible in a free LMS, but it is possible in a paid LMS. So this is the LMS of the Xbook Store. So if you heard uh, of the Arschoology, so this is better. So my recent books are here. Uh, let's look at one. Mm, Nakaset up na rin siya for virtual classroom. So uh, let's say in our book, there are nine lessons and we, we divided them into weeks para equivalent to one term course. And then at the end, meron akong course portfolio exhibit. Siyempre sa day one, dapat orientation, all the expectations are there. Tapos it ends with a portfolio exhibit. So these are the sample portfolios. So if I, uh, yung kaninang pinakita natin, so let's try one. Five minutes left. So, nandito naman yung kay, ito naman, uh, ito lalaki naman to na teacher. No? So, e-portfolio rubric niya, nandiyan. At lahat ng outputs niya. So, si Randren, the owner of this. So, kung may annotation sila. I require annotation so that they explain what they put here. And there are a lot there to see. Basta isang click mo dyan, madami ka makikita. Lahat ng mga yan, I, these are all files, additional files that they put there. The rubric is also given. And the heart of it is students' reflections. This is a video of how they did it. If I click it, you will hear what they uh, were sharing with their group. So that's one example. And it is already set up in the platform. Okay? I, where is it? Now, let's go back to Schoology. So how is that done if it's in the platform? So when you open the platform in a paid uh, LMS, so you have your portfolio. So I tried to show how it is done in the platform. So there is a portion there to, to share yourself. Who are you? What your interests are? Some information about you that could be of interest to others. My, my reflections, I, call, uh, I put that in the blog. Uh, things that I was able to develop. So imagine this as if it is a course. So what you require here are all put here. They are organized and better if they are annotated. Look at this one. These are all annotations. So my professional journey, uh, this folder contains my comprehensive blah, blah, blah. This one shows the research article that I, I was able to uh, uh, publish. Uh, this one, and uh, activities that I attended. So my annotation. So when you open, for example, one, um, let's say I travels, curious ako, ano itong mga pinuntahan itong bansa? So there is an annotation. What did you do in all those travels? Are they related? So it says here, uh, this report, this travel report submitted, uh, blah, blah, blah. So my travel report daw na submitted dito. And it shows a travel report. No? So my travel report. And everything is there. So, uh, and dami mong pwedeng gawin. This is one one uh, feature that I'm looking for in a platform as an assessor. So you can attach uh, some more files if you want, links, and you can come up with pages. So every folder here has all the, you know, the entries that uh, you want to uh, expect from the person. So, nakikita niyo yung number. So, ano ang pinakamadaming entry sa limbawa? Ah, travels. Ano, publication, 16. So, may uh, maraming nakalagay dyan na proof of what one uh, was able to accomplish. And again, that is portfolio assessment. It becomes um, an approach to assessing learning if there are annotations, if there are explanations why they are put there. So, that is a very important requirement when we uh, set portfolio as an, as an approach to assessing learning. Okay, I'm not nearing um, ending of the session. I'm sorry it took you long. So, ayan po yung mga kanina pinakita ko. 
Ah, uh, ko naman to i-share sa inyo po yung mga handouts ko uh, after this session so that uh, for those of you who were not able to uh, see everything, at least you could refer to my handout. And then again, if you are designing assessment, that should be part of your instruction. And if it's part of your LMS, magandang naka-structure ng maayos sa LMS na hindi masyadong hindi watak-watak yung uh, materials nyo. And then you can come up with your portfolio exhibit. Okay, so uh, this will, of course, there is a rubric. Everything that you require to your students, especially if it is graded, has to have a corresponding rubric which should be given at the start. Ha? Hindi po yung sa dulo na yung malapit ng mag-grade sa mga, ka, uh, when you are nearing the grading time. So it should uh, be made clear to the students at the very start. And that is what uh, OBD, uh, OBE. Outcome-based education and assessment uh, expects from us. So there is a rubric for, for the portfolio that I did there, right? So for other details on how to do a portfolio assessment that is also included in our book. Some issues that probably um, could be raised here too as they are recurring issues raised to me. Yung mga issue on authenticity, you cannot avoid, no? Yung mga issues na gano'n, not only there are issues... Um, not only in online assessment, but also in face-to-face. -face. Yung, yung originality ng written words, even in the face-to-face, -face, sometimes without, siya nga ba talaga gumawa niya? Ganyan din po, maski sa online. Ganun din po, wala pong pagkakaiba. But you can improve no, the, the process so that you could rely more on the data that you get from your students. So that you could be assured na talagang gawa ito ng bata o di may verification. You, you should not only look at the product, look at the process as well. You should not only rely on your judgment but also ask the students to judge themselves and maybe ask a feedback from the parents to the siblings and the peers. So get sources from um, everyone na possible. And the rule there that you should always remember is triangulation because no one is perfect. No, The data obtained from one source could be validated by another source. So if you are in doubt, involve more assessors. And here are some platforms that you can uh, use and access. Ako, masaya na ako sa mga forms and LMS. No? Sa totoo lang. But if you want to explore more to vary your assessment uh, strategies, that's better. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much. Sorry, it's 12 o'clock, but I can accommodate more uh, if you have questions. Uh, sir. Um, okay, Victor. thank you so much, Ma'am Marilyn. <clears throat> At this time, we will, be, kayo, sorry. we will be approaching a uh, ah. new section, a new phase in this webinar session, which is the open forum. And while we are at it, while we while our participants are taking their time okay. in crafting or constructing their questions, uh, Ma Marilyn, you may you may also have a quick break if you wish to, while we are consolidating some questions from the YouTube Live and Facebook Live, and the gr the group participants in the Zoom meeting. Okay, so I encourage everyone to raise their concerns now, as we are about to start the open forum. Sige po, sir, ha? Yes. Yes, po. Just let me know if there are questions. Please keep the questions coming. We are already receiving some questions in our YouTube live feed. Mm -hmm. But before we proceed to the YouTube live, we will first entertain some of the questions that will be given or will be raised in the Zoom meeting. So if you have if our participants, we have 38 participants currently in the Zoom group, in the Zoom group meeting. So you may raise your queries now. Uh, well, okay, so uh, since we are we do not have yet any questions raised in our Zoom meeting, we will have to entertain one question from our YouTube Live. This first question is from Jeffrey Loy Kagande of VSU, and here is his question. Ma Marilyn, are you still around? Yes, 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 yes. I'm okay. listening for. Okay, the question is this, ma'am. For student-centered learning, we are to give the responsibility of setting the objectives to students. However, with the current situation, 
we are asked to make a mojo for delivery without consulting the students. How are we going to go about creating a student-centered instruction? Thanks. That's like doing a test, you know. You could be ready with your test or uh, doing a TOS. Like I, I said a while ago, my practice is I prepare my TOS, then share this with my students. Then I ask them, look at the TOS. Uh, does it show a lesson that I did not actually cover in the class? Then that could be negotiated. So if you come across these items referring to this lesson that we did not actually cover, then this will be a bonus question. If I cannot modify any more the test. So it, yes. it, it can be presented to them even if it's already done, just like a module. That's a learning module anyway. So I think they don't have to worry whatever is put there. If they don't see valuable, they could just ignore it. Diba? If they see valuable, take it. Parang ganun yun eh. It's like uh, all options are given. If you need this, read it. If you don't need it, then ignore it. So there's nothing to worry and when we talk of learning modules. Yun po ang point ko. But we have to worry when we talk of assessment. If what is put in the module is not in the assessment and what is covered in the assessment is different from what was delivered or put in the module, that is where the problem comes in. So right. it, is, it is really the assessment that matters to most of us, especially if the assessment results are graded. And that's where we have to be very conscious, consultative, if we can show our, not the test, of course, but at least our structure, the framework. Like I said, um, in the case of testing, I show my TOS. Okay? Prior to taking the test. Parang let, diba? Diba? Uh, public. Ito yung coverage ng exam. Ito yung mga percentage. Ganon din ako, pero hindi lang ganon. I even put there, ano bang level, the, the TOS that I showed a while ago, it tells even the cognitive behavior that I'm targeting. So you see, it's more on high level. So don't try to memorize all the facts in the book because I will only be asking five questions and this could already cover uh, as many as this, uh, as shown in the TOS. So that's the beauty of making your TOS ahead of time so that this could be shared with your students. And I don't see anything harm in sharing your table of specifications to the students. It's not the test that you are sharing anyway. Now, when it comes to performance-based assessment, how will you make your assessment fair and student-centered? Again, you have to be ready with your rubric, but see your rubric as just a draft. Okay, it's not yet in its finality. It becomes final when the students sees it, when the students see it, accept it as all possible, given the kind of training they were exposed to or resources that are available to them when they were instructed and when assessment is being uh, done to them. Wow, so that's see a bit your rubric as always in its draft. Form. Even if I have been using the same rubric all throughout my teaching uh, career, laging may nakikita akong improvement or minsan yung acceptable last year, hindi acceptable sa situation ngayon. So that could be removed if it's not possible to meet by uh, all my students. So it is open for negotiation. I just have to make sure that the essentials are there, that even if let's say one criterion is removed because it could not accommodate all the, the situations of the students, I just have to make sure that the uh, intention of that assessment is not sacrificed. It should still be um, satisfied, but some uh, criteria and indicators could be uh, negotiable. I call that um, uh, student-centered as you are open to listening to students' views and feelings as they see themselves being subjected to the process of uh, whatever assessment that uh, you are asking them to go through. So that's okay. where the centeredness comes in to me. No? Mm -hmm. Once rubrics are, are ready and shared to them prior to doing the task and allowing them to voice out by examining you know, the elements in your rubric and see if they were reflective of how they were instructed and reflective as well of their well, yung sinasabi ko yung conditions nila. You know, uh, things that um, are beyond your control. Like in the case that we are experiencing, that uh, we are constrained of a lot of things. <laughs> and our situations, student situations are not comparable you know, to each other. Magkakaiba ang resources nila. Unlike pag nasa school, somehow nai-equalize kasi the same ang classroom, kahit mayaman, mahirap, pare-pareho ang, ang testing conditions and or assessment conditions in general. 
But if it's home-based, nagkakaroon ng differences. And that is where we have to be very sensitive and mindful of all these differences. Okay, so that was one very comprehensive answer right there. And uh, I have, I think I have to agree because right from, from the very start, it should always be the teacher to like the, to initiate and to be tactful in crafting the preliminary objectives of the, co of the competencies. And it is also up to him or her to modify as needed the materials that will be given to the yeah. students. Even the okay, weight, thank the negotiable, sir. Yung weight very, of the, right. the ratings given by the teacher and the students, meron, meron kang flexibility doon. Kasi baka yung iba online, pero alam mo naman yung degree, yung integrity is less than that right, of face-to-face. Right. Uh, -face. So you can modify. Medyo, you, you really have to exercise your professional judgment here. Okay. Kaya dapat talaga alam Thank natin you. yung consequences of our decisions. Not only to right. us teachers, but um, uh, most especially to our students. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, here, are, are we ready to entertain another question, ma'am? Sure. Okay, here's another from Bipsu, from Sir Willard N. Rivera. His question is, how do we develop effective rubrics? Do self-made rubrics need to undergo reliability testing to render all these exams. valid as tools for assessment? Yes, all exams. All exams and rubrics have to be subjected to validity and test of reliability. If we talk of rubrics, um, usually pwede dyan yung internal consistency reliability, inter-rater reliability. You see, uh, let's say uh, you, you here is a, a rubric, let's say it has undergone validation by experts, but it has not been subjected to reliability yet. So pwede kasing diba uh, ang evaluation merong peer, may student, and teacher. So, pwedeng i-compare mo yon. You look at one person, you judge this person's uh, performance using the same rubric. So, mayroong peer at saka teacher, then you compare your ratings. Kung walang significant difference, then we could consider the rubric to have inter-rater reliability. Kasi mm -hmm. the rating of the peer is as reliable as that of the teacher. Pwede rin intra-rater reliability, meaning let's say ako yon, ako yung rater na teacher, I will rate this, uh, pwede yan sa product. Salimbawa, so, itong essay ng sudyante, I'll rate it using my rubric. Then after two weeks, I'll revisit that essay again. Of course, the marks should not be reflected in the essay response. I-rate mo ulit. Then, using the same rubric. Pareho ba? Consistent ba yung rating ko dito sa work na to in my first uh, rating and second rating, not only to one person, but in all uh, students in that same section, meron bang consistency? Wala bang significant difference sa limbawa yung rating ko nung first sa second? And if there is no significant difference, again, you could say, ah, I, I uh, could say that my rubric has intra-rater reliability. So, consistency within the rater. Yung kanina, across rater. So, these are the types of reliability you could think of for uh, rubrics, but all instruments, rubric man po yan, or um, test, would need uh, validation. And when uh, we do the validation in rubric, yung criteria, nag agree ba siya dun sa competency that has been set? Could they define the competency that you have set? And that would require examination of experts. If this is a, a standardized uh, assessment where a constructed response, for example, is included like in international large-scale assessments, I have been uh, part of old uh, examinations and I was asked to validate the rubric so that that is possible that you are engaged to to check on the correctness of the identified criteria to a response given to a constructed response so pareho rin po yan pareho ibig sabihin ng, ng point ko ng pareho ay kaya yan ay test or rubric that has to undergo validation okay all right Thank you, ma'am. And here is another one question from our Zoom meeting participant, ma'am Beatrice Belonias of VSU. She is asking, based on your experience, ma'am, is requiring students to sign an honesty pledge effective? Uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, we have been just talking about this here in the control room in the university, and we are glad that someone actually had to ask today. Yes, so, I showed you a sample. That The one I... Uh, presented here was drawn from an old file uh, nasa email ko Pinaki dapat papakita ko sa email pa ibig sabihin po pina-practice ko na siya noon pa kasi hindi mo po ano eh hindi mo nga pwedeng um, 
you cannot you cannot just simply say ha ah, hindi honest lahat at least ma validate na talaga they are honest meron kang proof na this one has committed to be honest in responding to the test kasi i i sent it via email and the test could be accessed by anybody you know or shared it can easily be forwarded to others kaya i have to ensure that this person who submits such work to me has signed that honesty form kung hindi man totally honest yan at least meron akong panghahawakan that i could rely on the score because you have given your commitment uh, that you were true to yourself and not only to me <laughs> when you said this is your response in all honesty basta i will okay. rely on you because that's also true in pen and paper i mean in face to face diba can you control ta kung pa talaga mayroong mga magaling uh, to outsmart you in taking a test na pwedeng right, right. magcheat na hindi mo naman akalain pwedeng magawa no yung bang ganun there are things that we can't really totally uh, eliminate even even the process of developing the test is still subjective my dear even even in let's say multiple choice the format seems to be objective but the process in developing is still subjective so hindi talaga totally mawawala yung subjectivity and also the doubt uh, on students responses kung talagang response talaga ito nila na walang halong uh, alam mo na yung doubt no um okay uh, in, in other words po, pang ano lang yun, pang protect na talagang if you have to rely on it, yung level of confidence mo that this reflects of the true trait of the person is higher than not giving such honesty form. Kung in doubt ka pa rin, syempre ano po ang key, gandahan mo ang test mo na hindi po pwedeng mag-cheat. Na kahit open book ito, hindi niya mahahanap ang sagot sa libro. Yung parang ganon. So, right, right. There are many Actually, ways a, to to increase the integrity of assessment results. So, giving the assigning the honest honesty form is just one way. Improving hmm. eh, the test, making it um uh parang targeting the high order thinking skills that would really require construction of original ideas and not not necessarily getting ideas from others, borrowing the ideas of experts. I ma avoid parang that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. So uh, as of the moment, we are not already currently receiving some more questions in any of the platforms that we that we are having. Instead, we we are receiving too many compliments to our speaker right now. And I'd like to this this one is very noteworthy from Lilibeth Mirales. She said, ma'am, a two-semester course summarized to a three-hour discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Balagtas. <laughs> oh, All right, so, <laughs> so that's about <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank you very much, ma'am, for, uh, for the very comprehensive discussion of the topic today. And on, on a personal note, probably the, big, the biggest takeaway in this lesson or webinar is the thought that we can include one additional answer in the multiple choices. I was blown away yes. by that idea that, that where, where you can ask for the students individually unique responses. It, it's, I think it's a compelling force of student-centered learning. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and, and that's probably, something we are weak at. Our students are weak mm. at based on international large-scale assessments that our students are not... Uh, They're uh, not very much vocal. Their own response. Yung idea uh, of growth mindset ang ina-accommodate natin when we add E where we give them the option to provide their own response instead of just picking from a set of uh, ready-made responses. Okay, thank you ma'am. And uh, uh, that, Im that immersive reader facility in MS Word, mm. that, I mean MS Forms, that literally freaked me out for, a, for, a, for quite a time. And uh, I, I'm probably going to try it in my next classes. Yes. However, though, I would like to take this opportunity to, to remind our colleagues in the other institutions to use the softwares that are already available in their institutions, like the paid subscriptions, because those paid subscriptions already offer some premium features that we can use in delivering instruction. And as one wise person told me, we will always be presented so many options and we will easily be overwhelmed. However, we only need to pick one and mm. use it 
the best way that we can. Yes, yes, that's right. So that's right. probably one advice that I can give to everybody out there. And so thank you very much again, Ma'am Marilyn Balagtas. You're welcome. And for this, uh, for the uh, at this juncture, allow me to call Dr. Jude Eduarde, the mm -hmm. president sure. of Leyte Normal University and the chairman of the Content Development Committee, to present to us. I mean, to present, to award to the resource speaker, the certificate of recognition. Sir Jude. Uh, good morning, everyone. Oh, it's past 12 o'clock already. Oh, sorry, Paul. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, university officials, uh, Dr. George, Director George Colorado, university officials, uh, Dr. Marilyn Cardoso is on board. Uh, Participants, our source speaker this uh, morning, Dr. Balagtas, uh, good morning. First, allow me to thank you, Dr. Balagtas, for a very comprehensive, in-depth uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, this will help a lot in uh, taking off our flexible learning uh, semester. Uh, allow me first to read the citation of uh, the certificate. Eastern Messiah's Higher Education Institution uh, Certificate of Recognition is presented to Dr. Marlene Ovinia Balagtas for her invaluable service as a source speaker during the training workshop on course module, modules production for flexible learning in higher education institutions webinar series on June 17, 2020. Given this seventh day of June in the year of the Lord 2020, signed Norberto C. Olavides, PhD, President of BIT, Jude Duarte, DPA, President of Lake Normal University, Vector C. Cagneso, Jr., uh, EDD, President of BIPSU, uh, Director George Colorado of uh, CHED, Region 8, and uh, our dear Commissioner of Chet, Aldrin uh, A. Darilag, PhD. Thank you very much, Dr. Balagtas, for uh, you, a very impressive presentation. Thank you for appreciating the session po. Sana may napulot po kayo. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. Ingat po. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Jude. So there you have it, everyone. Once again, that was Dr. <coughs> Marilyn Obinia Balagtas of Philippine Normal University. And from the comfort of our homes, let us give her a resounding, warm, virtual round of applause. So uh, uh, we, currently we are receiving some more questions, but I think time would not warrant anymore that we can entertain this. Uh, if, if there are any way, ma'am, that they can contact our participants today and, and ask you personally these questions, how, how can they contact you? I have my contact references. numbers po dun sa, I will share my PowerPoint later. I'll just pick some parts. And uh, it will include my uh, mobile number and email. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. So there you have it, everyone. That pretty much wraps up our webinar for today. And for the final reminders and notes, allow me to call the, the, the Northwest Summer State University Human Resource Development Officer, Mrs. Janet T. Salem, to give us some final notes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Marilyn Balagtas, for your well-defined discussion in this morning's Thank webinar. You. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, for our... Uh, for the reminders, um, for our attendance in this morning's webinar, you may scan the QR code or you may type the URL to your browser in order to access the Google form or the attendance link. And we have another webinar on Friday, that's June 19, 20, uh, 2020, at 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And the topic is Monitoring and Evaluating Curricular Offerings, a Reflexive Account. The guest speaker is Dr. Roby Marlina. Thank you so much. Okay, so again, there you have it, everyone. That pretty much wraps up our webinar for today. Thank you so much for your participation, and we hope to see you on the next webinars, or better yet, on the next seminars, when we are already allowed to gather physically following this pandemic. For now, you stay safe with your families, enjoy the rest of this Wednesday, and have a good lunch. Good afternoon. Yes. Good day to everyone. Stay safe.
Salamat po. Thank you. Bye, ma'am. Bye-bye po.